And I think it looks like we're on. Yes. Okay, so this is the Battery Park City Committee for Community Board 1. My name is Justine Cuccia, and I am the chair of this committee. Um, Kathy Gupta is the co-chair. She's not on yet, and I don't know what the deal is, but I'm, I'm waiting to hear back. But we also have a number of other members on the line right now, which are Betty Kay, Bob Schneck, uh, Judith Weinstock, Sarah Cassell, um, and we have other board members who are not part of the committee, but Deda Ahi and Jill Goodkind. And we are going to start. Um, so Robert's rules is the way that this, this meeting runs, which means that we have people raising their hands to ask questions. Um, I will call on them people to speak and everybody will get their turn. Um, I'm looking to have everybody speak. I know we've got a bunch of people um, in the attendee section. And I want you to pay attention to the agenda order so we can go through that and pay attention to the, the order in which things are going. And our first first line of business, sorry, distraction behind me. First line of business is going to be talking about allied universal ambassadors. So I want to introduce Patrick Murphy, Nick Spordone, and Eric Munson. Um, Patrick Murphy is, is the head of, of allied universal. He comes to every meeting and reports up to us as to what's going on with Allied, and we're going to want to engage in a dialogue with, with um, Patrick, and he's been very kind and agreed to give us his time and attention to kind of explaining what the role of the ambassadors are, as they understand it, as they've been hired to, to be um, engaged, and they have been hired to be engaged by the uh, Battery Park City Authority, and Nick Spordone and Eric Munson are here from the Battery Park City Authority, so they can also kind of give color to it. Um, I, I know that from uh, email exchanges and some uh, in the in the in the next door neighborhood chat, there's been a lot of conversation going back and forth. I'm going to insist that everybody be respectful. I understand that there are people who are angry and um, frustrated. Part of why I wanted to have this dialogue tonight is because I want Allied to be able to explain what it is they are have been hired as a private security force to do for us in Battery Park City. They are hired, they are a private security force, but what does that mean? What does their contract say? What do they understand that to mean? Then I wanna hear from the community with questions and I wanna hear what the community has in terms of their perceptions and their expectations for what a private security force is for them and what they expect from Allied. And then we can see where that, where, where that balances out, where the expectations meet the reality and we go from there and perhaps have a conversation and dialogue to move forward with to say, okay, this is what they're doing, but or this is what they're contracted to do, but we want them to do this. Um, we'll see where that goes. But first, I'm going to turn this over to Nick and Patrick and Eric Hansen. So, you guys, if you're unmuted, if you're not, you're, I think just unmute yourself and go in the order in which you want to speak. So, maybe Nick, okay. first, you want to introduce? Yes, thank you so much, Justine and Lucian and uh, members of the committee. Thanks. Um, and for the intro as well, as Justine had noted, Patrick and I uh, have the pleasure of being here every month to the committee to report out all sorts of happenings within and throughout Battery Park City. And part and parcel of that standing report is kind of Pat's update on uh, security matters um, each month. So uh, thanks for the intro and what I wanted to do tonight, given that um, I know there were some questions and we kind of went through a little bit of this exercise uh, last year with Allied when um, the contract was coming up for bid. Um, I've asked Eric Munson, uh, who is our chief operating officer as well, and who kind of oversees the general security posture for the Battery Park City Authority to join us as well. So if it pleases the committee, we're going to hand it over to Eric. He'll give a short um, kind of presentation, just setting uh, a little bit of a framework so folks understand kind of uh, what Allied is, what they do, what they don't do, and how they function within the overall general framework of um, security and at a larger level law enforcement uh, in the first precinct with uh, that we work very closely with the New York Police Department's first precinct on, of course. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Eric, who uh, I think should be teed up. And uh, Lucian, thanks for getting that uh, presentation up for us. He'll drive and Eric will give, uh, give the cues as he proceeds. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Thank you thanks, Justine. Eric. Thanks, Eric. Go ahead. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Justine. Um, Lucian, maybe for changing of the slides, I'll like pull my earlobe or something like a 
you should, symbol like you should steal third base or something like that. I'm watching like a hawk. Great. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm Eric Munson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Authority. The security portfolio at the Authority reports directly to me. Um, it's important to us, and I managed not just the prior Allied contract, but also the um, the procurement of the new Allied contract, which took uh, took effect last November 19th. And so, um, did a bit of a roadshow last summer with members of the committee, and then presented to the committee both before and after we entered into that contract with Allied to solicit feedback on. Um, the future of the program and where folks wanted to see it. Um, and so I uh, took that that deck that I used um, back last December, which was 363 days ago, and just um, updated it a little bit with some additional information um, I had in reading the description of um, today's uh, meeting topic. I had seen that um, that one of the topics that, that you folks wanted to cover was, was what's really in the Allied contract. And so I, I plucked some provisions from the contract, which I have on a, on a slide here, so we can go over that. And then I'm really here along with Pat and Nick to listen to your feedback. Um, again, this is, I see it as part of an ongoing dialogue that we have together. I think, you know, Pat really works hard to um, be accessible. And I know Nick and I feel the same way that we want um, feedback both immediate and often. So to the extent that you see something, tell us right away. There's no need to wait until one of these community board meetings. Um, you should feel free to reach out to any of the three of us and we'll work to make things better. Again, our, our work with regards to security is, is never done, but it's also never perfect. And so to the extent that we flip, um, you know, we want to do things better. And so we're here to listen to you on, on how we can do that. So with that, I'll give my first feel third symbol. There we go. So any, any security discussion in Battery Park City really has to talk, um, has to start rather with a discussion on crime fighting. And so that is really with regards to the first precinct. And part of the reason why we shifted our focus uh, last year with regards to um, our approach with Allied um, has been the, the advent of community policing at the NYPD. And so the four folks who are mentioned um, at the, in the bottom bullet there are neighborhood coordination officers. Many have attended this committee meeting in the past um, and have made themselves accessible. They share their cell phone numbers with us. And, and when I say with us, I mean publicly. They encourage you to reach out to them directly um, for um, you know, not to observe, to report crimes in progress, but rather to mention quality of life issues or to provide intel on recurring incidents that um, take a more sort of nuanced approach to calling crime, to fighting crime. But the first, the, one of the things that I'll say in the context of, of this slide is to the extent that you uh, witness a crime or are victim to a crime, again, um, don't call the command center at, at Allied Universal, call 911. Um, because if you were to call the command center and report a crime, they would call 911. And so cut out the middle person in that instance and really call the NYPD. We have a great relationship with the first precinct. They do a tremendous job. There's um, a neighborhood coordination council meeting tomorrow evening, which Pat will attend like he attends every month and Nick attends most of them as well. I think maybe all of them. Sorry, Nick. Um, but so again, I, I would just encourage you to, to start with the, the first precinct. Uh, Sorry, it's Nick Spordone. Just to jump in, a second. Yeah. apologies. I, don't, I say this only because that was the case uh, in the in the process of preparing my report. I checked back in with the first precinct. In fact, the first precinct community council meeting this month is now looking like it's going to be December seventeenth. So that's two Thursdays from tomorrow. Apologies, that just came in. Uh, it's in my report as well, but uh, so same idea. It's just two Thursdays it's, from now, not tomorrow. It's not tomorrow night. It's in two Thursdays. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, Eric. Thank you. Lucian, if you could go to the next slide, please. Cool. So, as many of you know, um, prior to 2015, um, we worked with um, the Parks Department on policing exclusively in our parks. Um, 
but to address some shortcomings that we had heard from the community and also that we had identified ourselves, um, we did a, a public solicitation and ended up hiring Allied um, to do a sort of more expanded scope. And that scope um, expanded not just geographically from parks to outdoor patrols, but also um, provided some other services that are outlined in the bullets there at the bottom. So this is the start of the ambassador program. The idea being that these folks are the eyes and ears for both the authority and also the NYPD, um, notifying patrons if they're breaking parks rules, running a command center that's staffed 24 seven, 365 to monitor our camera network, to field calls and complaints and reports from the public and also to coordinate with PD on safety matters. So the idea wasn't just that they were writing tickets for dog violations, for example, but it really a sort of more holistic and proactive approach to security in the neighborhood. That was the vision. That was Lucian, the idea. Next slide. Next slide is fine. Um, Eric, I've got a question for you on that, and maybe it's going to address, but um, eyes and ears of the neighborhood and, um, kind of like a liaison between the police or the community and the police. What does that mean in terms of what, like I want to get into the weeds of what is it that they do in situations? Because I think sometimes people are frustrated. They expect the um, ambassadors to be doing X, Y, Z, and their level of engagement is ABC. Thank you. Um, and and addressing that. Yeah, sorry, yes, my. Uh, <laughs> It's all right. Some seltzer water. Thank okay. you. Sorry. So here are some here are some excerpts from their contract. I should add that the contract is a super long document. I didn't include the whole thing. I also didn't include the whole scope. But I thought that these are the sort of salient points. So you know, first and foremost, the roving patrols throughout the site. The idea is that we don't just have folks sitting and watching the cameras that are in the neighborhood, but rather we have folks that are a visible presence that are in assigned locations that we agree upon mutually and that they're proactive in safety, security, and community engagement issues. And so I'll let Pat get into the specifics if you have individual questions about this incident happened, how would you want an ambassador to respond? But to the extent that, again, they witness a crime in process, I want them to call PD. To the extent that um, they witness the violation of a parks rule, that's the second bullet here, is we want them to contact um, the person who's violating the parks rule and inform them of the rules and ask them to stop. Um, we also, as we've discussed a bunch of times with the committee before, have the special patrol officer program. And so this was uh, created as a way to provide Allied the ability to issue tickets to folks who are unwilling to follow the rules. So to the extent that we have recurring incidents in the neighborhood, oftentimes it's with regard frankly, to, to dogs, um, but there are also a handful of other violations. Um, we've uh, worked with the PD to provide them special patrol officer status so that they can issue um, summonses for those violations. Um, and then on a few other items, you know, they issue real-time reporting to us. Um, we also can track them as they are around the neighborhood to make sure that we actually have the staff deployed as we've requested them to be. So if somebody says I'm in Teardrop Park right now and I don't see an ambassador, I can, you know, while lying in bed at night, look on my phone and see where the ambassador is in Teardrop Park or identify the fact that there isn't one and address the situation. Um, and then just a quick shout out to Pat at the bottom here, but we we wrote expressly in the in the contract to make sure that we have someone who has law enforcement experience and ties to, to serve as a primary contact, um, not just with local law enforcement, but also to be a sort of main point of contact with members of the community and to attend um, meetings like these. Lucian, next slide. So here's the special patrol officer. Again, I won't dwell on this, but um, you folks asked for a special patrol officer status. We worked with the PD to develop that status. I, I will mention that um, as a result of COVID-19, the, the police department put a bit of a pause on the licensing division, um, allowing for us to submit additional names. So um, we have 
um, some special patrol officers, but we're not yet at sort of full special patrol officer strength yet. It's a, a goal for the year ahead. Um, Eric, how many do we have now and how many are we aiming for? We're aiming for 11 and Pat, I think we have five now. Is that right? And how many are working each shift? And I'm assuming, and what's a shift? Every eight hours, every 12 hours? Uh, we operate on three shifts and I won't share right now how many we have at, at all times. But and we, you're not sharing work, it for the sake of security, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. We don't want to tip people off to the fact that X time is the right time to have your dog on the lawn break, yeah. breaking the pooper scooper law. <laughs> but one one could could um can can could could infer that there is at least one um SPO on duty twenty four seven. Uh I don't necessarily want to say that. We really oh. deploy them based on the need. Okay. I think I think the, the vast majority of the time there are special patrol officers working, but I don't want to make a blanket statement that we always have one on staff. All right. And where do they, um, well, I guess this is another one that's going to be security, but they're roving, I'm assuming. They're not in the office all the time, right? That's correct. No, the idea is that they're in the office as, as little as possible. Got it. Okay. Lucian, Lucian, can you hear me? So again, here's just an example of some of the technology that we have as a result of the contract with Ally, just because oftentimes we hear um, concerns about the lack of visible presence in the community, which again is what I see as one of the primary um, issues that we're trying to address. And so um, this is just a, a screenshot of what I pull up if I want to identify um, you know, where someone has been over the course of their shift. Um, in one of our parks, there's Teardrop, and Ambassador Martinez has been at various locations in the park over the course of their shift. And I could right now just pull up again on my phone to see where folks are. Um, and, and so some of the technology you'll often see ambassadors on their phones. That's a, another issue that we hear often, which I, um, again, we want ambassadors to proactively engage members of the public. Um, and so if their head is in their phone the entire shift, it's really challenging to do that, as you might imagine. But we do want them to um, scan geotags, which we have to make sure that um, high traffic areas are caught and, um, and addressed by the ambassadors regularly. Um, and also that they're submitting their reports, which they do via their phone. Um, and, and, and what's so, the report saying no trouble, um, uh, saw five dogs or just, you know, had a fight with or had a disagreement with a resident about their dog off a leash? I and mean, that's the kind of report. Yeah, so there, uh, right below that map there is an example of what a report yeah. looks like. Okay, so dog violation. Okay. Yeah. And they took and pictures. There's like, yeah. yeah, where it is and um, the photos and sort of what the resolution was. And and I will say, and I'm sure that's going to be people. Um, by the way, Kathy Gupta is in the in the attendee mission, and I didn't know if anybody else is, but I saw Kathy. Um, one of the things I think some of the people in the attendee list are going to mention are going to be you, you could walk on the Esplanade at any given time of the day and go. I mean, I know for myself, I have gone from. Uh, 200 rector all the way up to Stuyvesant and beyond and come home. And, and, you know, granted, that's a bit of time, the coming home part, too, and never seen a, um, an ambassador. How is that possible? I don't know. And, and how could you be more visible? Yeah. I mean, and that's a regular thing that people are saying. So, and, and I believe that the geotagging is occurring. Maybe they're behind a tree. Maybe I'm not paying attention. Maybe they're, you know, and, and it's fair enough that I'm not seeing everything. And I'm not looking for them particularly, except sometimes I am, just to, just to note yeah. that I've seen them. Yep, yep. I will tell you that's not the outcome that we're looking for. We want the ambassadors to be visible over the course of the day. Um, and so um, I will tell you that, um, you know, the expectation is that the ambassadors are patrolling. We check the data to make sure that they are patrolling regularly. Um, but I, I'll just, I'll say that, you know, it's, that's, I, I don't know why in those specific instances the ambassadors aren't visible and and where they are, but it's our expectation that they will be, and that's why we've that's why we've hired them. 
so from your, I guess, from your looking at the geotagging and the performance dashboard and everything else you're looking at from you, you do not see an issue with where they are at any given time. I mean, and, and is there a way for you to check? Like, I know you said you could look at your phone now. That's just a point in time randomly. Is there a way that people's people could be evaluated or a shift can be evaluated to say where were they and how is it working? And is that done? Yeah, so this is an example of, of Ambassador Martinez's um, like a, a period of time and where she was in in Teardrop Park over the course of a, a set period of time. It's not over her entire shift, but it's over a period of time. And so I won't, again, we, yeah. we've hired allies to um, to provide this work. And so I it, it's not my expectation that we'll be um, micromanaging their work. At the same time, it is my expectation that they'll manage themselves. And that's, you know, that's what... Pat does on the daily, so to speak, and so he, you know, that, he works with both him, his own uh, staff and also the staff of his subcontractor to make sure that they're doing their jobs. I guess that might be something that I'm going to keep in the back of my mind as a thing is that perhaps there needs to be more um, follow up with them from on Pat's part, not the, necessarily the authorities. And I don't know if that's a true statement, but. Perhaps that's what we want to see in a report is, is is how is it being done? I'm not sure. Let's let the community talk before I jump in and, and let them, you know, anticipate too much of what they're going to say. But go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. I think you're almost done with the slides, right? Just, 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 just a few more. I have a quick question. Yes. Go ahead. Justine, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Pat. Okay. Uh, just to step in to answer that question. Uh, the iPhones, they all have GPS on it, okay? So you can, you can log in and basically even at the command center, the safety ambassador that's at the desk can even log in and see where a safety ambassador is. We also have it, what we call, what's technically called geofenced, mm -hmm. which means that if they go, let's say, walk to the other side of the West Side Highway or West Street, Mm -hmm. Okay, we get a notification on it. Okay, so we know that they're out of their zone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know if they leave the area. Okay. All right. So that that's that's the other other backup with it. All right, uh, mm -hmm. as part of the technology, and and the other thing too is they have regular tours, and by uh, hitting or scanning the geotags, whatever way you want to phrase it. It stayed in time stamped. So, so you're knowing that at that moment in time that they've tagged it, they are there where they're supposed to be, and one's going to assume they've been in the area. They're not like right. going quickly from place to place. I mean, who right. And, and that that occurs, you know, uh, where let's say something happens in Rockefeller Park, which is big, mm -hmm. and being that we're in the winter time, we're down personnel, so one person will be assigned to all of Rockefeller Park. Ah. Okay, so let's say an incident happens uh, up by Sty um, down by the Irish Hunger Memorial. You're not going to see and, anybody by Stuyvesant. <laughs> right. We can see, okay, when it happened, the safety ambassador was up at Stuyvesant High School. He, you know, he uh, scans the geotag on the life ring at the date and time that that occurred mm -hmm. okay so you know it's you know and at the same time it can save you and it can hurt you because you know yeah you were down there we could see that you were down there how come you didn't see it okay so where i can address it with the safety ambassador on a follow-up and is that done regularly the the, the follow-ups and the checking of things oh yeah when oh. when things occur when things occur and they come across you know, definitely. Uh, okay. For instance, uh, there was uh, a communication to Nick the other day, and it was oh, a safety ambassador uh, getting into a confrontation with uh, a resident. Okay, over by uh, the marina. Okay, so I, I went into the system and I knew where a lot of people were, and we don't patrol the marina. Right. You know, and you know, at the same time, and I also know that uh, Brookfield has another security company there that now they wear the same type of uniform that we do. Yep. So you know. Yep. 
So this way I could say to Nick when it got flipped to me, hey, Nick, this is where all our people were at the time. Nobody was there, you know, walking through at that time that uh, this incident, uh, you know, occurred. Interesting. So I want to keep that incident in mind because I want to follow it through. Um, I want Eric to finish and I want to give the community and the and the board also a chance to talk because we've been going for a while now and I know the community is online and they do have things to say. But that's an interesting yep, yep. thing because good to know that your guys were not involved in whatever that incident was. But I also want to know what happened after that. But go ahead. Let's not talk about that yet. Okay. I'm going to be super quick with these last two slides. They're super quick. One is I just wanted to mention that in addition to providing the sort of conventional security services, because we have a significant allied staff presence in the public, Lucian, could you flip to the next slide? Um, thanks. Just because we have them out and about, they observe um, maintenance and other issues in the, in the neighborhood and flag them for our maintenance staff, um, as well as provide some support on some other services that are not security related or maintenance related. And so just flagging the fact that this 7,000 number was um, from last year. I'm sorry, I didn't pull the number from the past 12 months, but it's, um, it's a lot of incidences where they've noticed, um, you know, in this instance uh, that we have on the, on the slide, there's a, a masonry issue where there's a missing hex paver that, um, you know, where someone could trip and injure themselves. Um, we have when there are street lights that are out that creates a security issue, those issues are flagged for us. Um, we have unsecured property, the sort of when you see something, say something mantra. Um, helping folks with wayfinding issues and lost and missing persons. I'll, I'll just mention that that seems to have recurred quite a bit over the course of the past few months, but there was a, a missing person last week that Allied helped connect with his parents. Um, and so just there's added value there um, beyond just the um, just the security elements. And then just this last slide, Lucian, if you don't mind, just flagging that um, this has been, as everyone knows, a, a heck of a year. Um, Allied are there for us essential workers. And so they've been at full staff um, throughout the pandemic since um, before it started and now through it. Um, thankfully, they've been in, in good health, um, but, you know, th throughout it all, they've approached members of the public who haven't been wearing masks and asked them to change their behavior, which sometimes results in confrontation. Um, and, you know, that's uh, a, a challenging thing to do in, you know, April and May of a pandemic, given the circumstances. Um, and they've been truly tremendous in that regard. Um, we, with the thanks to the, the city and health and hospitals, um, provided them with masks, which they now distribute in the community. They've distributed some, but frankly, they've been getting turned down quite a bit over the past um, few weeks. Um, there have been, uh, there was a tropical storm back in August, Isaias, where um, as they had after other major storms like snowstorms and other uh, weather events, they've um, done a, a full review of the neighborhood and caution taped areas and flagged areas for our maintenance and horticulture teams to address um, safety issues that have arisen as a result of weather events. Um, we talked about both the lost children um, that have been reconnected with family and their caregivers and also the special patrol officer program that they've been um, working on expanding. But I just wanted to take a couple minutes to mention the uh, important work that they've done over really, really challenging circumstances this past year. It's been um, it's been heroic in many instances. So a thanks to them. And again, um, you know, this is my my last slide here. We really are here to listen. But again, I just want to mention that if after um, today's meeting, if something comes to mind um, that you you know that you didn't mention over the course of this evening. Um, feel free to reach out to Nick, Pat, or myself um, and uh, be happy to have a longer conversation with you about it. Again, our, our work to improve the program is, is never finished. And uh, with your help, I think we can make a lot of progress. So with Thank that, you. I'll hand it back to the chairwoman. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Patrick, for jumping in with the explanation. And, and thank you. It was a great presentation. It was a great review of what we have been presented with before. Um, I am not going to speak more. I am going to ask Andrew Zelter, whose hand was raised. He took it down, but I'm going to give him the floor first. If he doesn't have anything to say, then Bob Schneck, then Alex from the um, attendee list, and then Taylor from the attendee list. And Sonia from the attendee list after that. So, um, Andrew, if you want to speak. Yep. Thanks, Justine. Thanks so much. Um, sorry, I joined a few minutes late, so I might have missed it. But the, the issue of lack of visibility is, is that line of questioning a result of comments we're receiving from the community that they're they're incurring problems in the park and they're having difficulty locating a PEP officer? That's that's one. And then my second question is, what happens in the event of a community member initiated confrontation with a PEP officer? Are there any follow up actions? And I ask that question because I, I can just speak during our little league season when the PEP officers correctly ask people to relocate from the lower level to the upper level for safety reasons. At times, I have to tell you, it's appalling to observe the behavior that yeah. our community displays when dealing with these PEP officers. And I'm just curious if, if there's ever any action or follow up that's that's taken. Two things. So let me answer your question first, and then I'm going to pass the second one to Patrick. What I have heard from the community at large, whether they're emails or phone calls or texts or just people bumping into me on the street, plus my own observation. I am not necessarily looking for a ambassador and not finding them. I know where to find them if I have to. I know I, I know who to call. I know uh, go to the office. So whenever I have needed an ambassador, I have managed to track one down pretty quickly. That's my personal experience. I'm hopeful that the people in the chat can add in their two cents. My comment was solely that I don't see them and that I don't notice them, which may be good and may not be good. I don't know. But um, in answer to your second question, oh, and there's something else too, you're calling them PEP officers, no PEP officers. That was our old contract. These are allied universal ambassadors. So yeah, I caught myself when I no, said that. Thanks for yeah, that. That's correction. okay, but just different levels of people. But anyhow, Patrick, um, if you don't mind answering um, Andrew's second question about the, what's the what's the timeline and what happens? Andrew. Yeah, Patrick, would you answer what Andrew said? Did you hear, did you hear it? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I I understand the question. Uh, really, if it's if it's negative, if the experience is negative uh, toward you know the safety ambassador toward the general public, uh, that safety ambassador is no longer assigned to Battery Park. I move them out. Okay. Uh, and it has occurred where a safety ambassador used the wrong word, and that safety ambassador was removed from our site. So, sorry, Patrick. So, sorry, my, my question, first of all, I, I, I think it's been a dramatic improvement going from PEP to ambassadors, so I just want to put that out there. But two, my question was, if the poor behavior or or negative interaction as a result of behavior displayed by the community member, not your ambassadors. Yeah, that's what oh, I was okay. thinking too. Yeah, yeah. Do, do we do anything to address that behavior? And that might not, I don't know if that's a question for you, for Battery Park City Authority or the community board. I'm not sure where that sits. Well, uh, to be to be honest, Alex, uh, Andrew, you know, I, I, I appreciate your uh, coaches because there have been times where your coaches have walked over and addressed the individual, uh, you know, because of their reaction with the safety ambassador. Uh, I, I commend them for that. But to say that uh, we there's any follow up on our end with uh, with that community person. No, there's not. You know, after all, I, I don't know who that person is. Uh, the safety ambassador doesn't know who the person is. All they know is it's probably a parent 
or a relative of some child that's on the team. And that's as far as it goes. But I have to say, uh, some of the coaches that you have, uh, they have addressed it with the parents. So uh, I, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, we, we try we try and apply a, a zero tolerance level to our DLO parents if they're in the area and they they just go off on an ambassador. We we do take action in that regard, and I I don't know how you do it more broadly. I don't know that you can, but I was just curious if there was anything in place. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bob. thank you for thank you for your support, Alex. On that, I appreciate it. Bob Schneck next, and then Jill. I want to make you wait until after the the three public attendee members attendees, but then we'll go back. So go ahead, Bob. Okay, uh, I just want to want to discuss a range of issues, and I'm happy to uh, reduce them to writing and send them in if we want to treat them as a whole bunch of special things. But I just want to. I've been I've been involved with this for a long time, and I have some very general and developed opinions. And firstly, I'd like to, to say, like Andrew, I really agree that it's it's better than PEP. And, and I have I actually handled a, a, a number of re genuine dangerous encounters with PEP, and they were <laughs> and they were they were more disappointing than my encounters with the ambassadors. Um, also, as a follow on to the general discussion, I also have often seen uh, times when there were i walk five to ten miles a day now and i walk along uh, i walk in battery park territory for most of that time and i often don't see ambassadors uh, so it's, it's pretty common for me but then i do see them sometimes and i appreciate it but i want to talk about how those interactions work so in the in the general discussion i want to say that i really am um pleased with community policing, and I'm really glad to know the names of some of our local officers. And I really think that they try to interact on a first name basis, and they actually have business cards that they can hand to you to make contacts. And so that's a really good thing. The only, uh, the only interface problem that I think continues between Battery, Battery Park City Authority and the real 911 police is they still don't really know the area very well. <laughs> they, they can, even the ones that I know the names of, if I could give them geographic tests and they couldn't pass them, <laughs> which, which is interesting. And so in emergencies, we should make sure they know where they are. I'm not sure if the ambassadors know where they are, but I presume because they make all those interactions uh, with those life preservers that they actually have a good sense of that. The one other thing is, yeah? I think one would hope the ambassadors know where they are. That would be. Yeah, but that's a, this, the, the, we, I, we might want to get to that as a question. The other thing is, you have the police on one side of it. You have the, you have the downtown alliance on the other side. How these things kind of work together as 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 Pete says, uh, incidents cross over from one to the other. I think that's important. So then, uh, since these guys are called ambassadors, then I, uh, in listening to the facts about the contract, what do I really expect about ambassadors? The first th difference between PEP and the ambassadors is they're not armed, and I think I think that's terrific. I think I think I think uh, forty five changes my relationship with anybody, holstered or not. So I'm really glad that they are unarmed. But I also feel as though an advantage of community policing is I actually know the names of some of them. And I would I think that the actual guy, I really love Patrick, but I really think that we should raise the stature of some of the normal people that actually do the work. So they could go to as themselves, introduce themselves to the build a block meeting, introduce themselves to the uh, neighborhood. Uh, our our community board meetings, so we actually get to meet some of these guys, and they even could, um, they could even you know may, maybe be stand-ins for Patrick every once in a while because they really are community uh, policing kind of guys. The next thing I wanted to mention about them is I often find that they 
<laughs> really don't know much about the neighborhood. I've mentioned this before at meetings, but I think it's worth mentioning again that they really should know something about the activities, the geography, and the people that are here, and they should actually strive as ambassadors to, to develop relationships on a first name basis with the people who uh, work as concierges with the people who sit on the benches and are part of the community with the Battery Park seniors, etc. So I think there's an opportunity there uh, to grow uh, the relationship. I think um, one of the things uh, I heard that seemed to be an opportunity is in the contract that said that the community could work together with uh, with the ambassador team to kind of find the assigned locations. So maybe if Justine is interested, we could actually look at the routes that they cover and the timing, you know, kind of how that stuff is set up and actually weigh in on saying, yeah, that's really a best, the best given the limitations we have, that's the best way to cover it or well, give input to whether or not those things could be adjusted a little bit and work a little better. Um, so, Bob, I think these are good ideas. I'm cutting you short because I really want to get to the other people on the attendee list, but I think that's a good idea. I think Patrick's answer to what you just said is that that's not going to be for public consumption, but that might be a working group so that for you know certain eyes to look at that and get input and then be able to have that information to add um, color, I suppose, and 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 depth to what the how how the um, Ambassadors are being evaluated and their performance, not personally, like I don't care performance review, but how they are serving us as the public. So that's I a conversation. To, I to have. One more quick point that I wanted yeah, to make that ahead, quick, actually could be thrown into that. It's real quick. I think it's an important one. They there have been uh, there's been the idea of the development of the special patrol officer, mm -hmm. and we I think as a community board might want to direct that. Yeah. and talk about what they do and how they do it and have a better understanding of what tickets they can issue, what the police is, what what responsibilities the, the police are willing to yield to them in the future and kind of how that could develop so that there's actually community input in that. And I rest I think my voice. <laughs> thank you, Bob. No, and I appreciate that. And I think that if the people in the chat do speak up, uh, I think you're gonna hear questions along those lines. Okay, so Alex, Lucian, first un unmute Alex and then Taylor, then Sonia, and then we'll go to um, Jill and then Kathy. No problem. Just shuffle some of these windows around so I can find Yeah, that. yeah, no, that's okay. You said Alexi first? Alexi first. Okay. Alexi, you're, you're good to go. Great, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I thank Patrick uh, for his great work. That's point number one. Um, and uh, I'd like to reiterate uh, the visibility issue uh that we might not see many ambassadors around so i've observed that as well uh and uh so there was a question of what's the uh, what are expectations and uh, you no know, suggestions so i would say that one could um have ambassadors set good examples uh by uh, their own action uh so uh let me explain um some negative sound issues that don't set good examples. Um, um, so, for, for instance, uh, safety ambassadors have, have been seen walking next to each other, say two or three ambassadors together, without face coverings, which is against the New York State regulations, unless these member, they are members of the same household. So that's not a great example. Um, so in other instance, uh, uh, they have been seen entering the 200 vector place location without a face mask. And so they, they possibly endanger Patrick, who shares the same office with them. Um, uh, an ambassador was seen smoking in Teardrop Park, while smoking is not permitted in any of the parks. And uh, ambassadors have been using their personal cell phones while on the job. Uh, so I, I think uh, by not doing these things, it would be you know they would be setting a better example. Uh, so so uh, uh, these are these are my comments. Thank if you I could just, just, and I just and want to 
to the extent that there is a record, I want to say that the ambassadors need to be wearing a mask at all times, right? In the course of their in the course of their duties and in compliance with the, the governor's executive order. Smoking in the park is something that an ambassador um, would instruct uh, um, uh, you know another another parks user um, that they that they cannot do. And there, in fact, you know the um, the police have issued summonses for those violations. So again, the, the issues that you're raising, Alexi, are important ones. And again, to the extent that the the ambassadors have been safe throughout the pandemic, um, you know, is you know feel very very fortunate. But it relies on mask wearing and those types of precautions. Um, and so I, you know. To the extent that you see those things happening, and I direct this not just to you, but to the, the rest of the attendees today, we want to know about it because that behavior isn't acceptable. Um, you know, but everyone needs to be wearing a mask right now. So the numbers are increasing and it's nothing could be more important. So that's good to hear, Eric, and I appreciate that. And I guess what I'd like to say is I know Alexi has been speaking to Patrick. And I know that he's he's very good about um, taking pictures and bringing, bringing stuff up. And I guess what is concerning to me is what's being done about it. And, and I'm sure that that's the part of what he's not saying. Um, and, and I don't know if there's an answer that Patrick can give us or not give us, but. Um, yeah, the, the answer, the answer pretty much is if the safety ambassador is going into 200, he's on break on the inside. So he's going into he or she mm -hmm. is going in to have their meal. OK, there's usually no more than two safety ambassadors inside on break at the same time. And they're split up because there's a kitchen with a table and then there's the back room. OK, they're permitted to take off the face mask to eat and drink while they're back there. And they're in there for about a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And then they're back out on their post. Okay, so that that's what happens there. Uh, if you see uh, three safety ambassadors, I'm not happy hearing. Uh, if you see two, one is usually a supervisor inspecting the safety ambassador out on the site. Okay, so uh, three, I'm not happy about hearing, but you know, I don't know what day uh, it occurred. So if, and this is what I've always put out there, if I'm notified about it as it occurred that day, you know, and at roughly a time, I can bring it up and find out who it was. And then I take care of it through, you know, Allied has progressive discipline and that's what we deal with. Excellent. That's good to okay. hear, Patrick. Thank you. And yes, people certainly have to take their masks off to eat, but in coming in and coming out, they should be wearing masks, especially inside. And, you know, but the people sitting at the desk should have their masks on unless they're eating or drinking. Right. That, oh. that makes sense. I have a quick question. What about ambassador smoking himself? Uh, smoking is not permitted at all. It's a park and you're not supposed to be smoking in the park at all. Because that's so. some of the rules they're supposed to be enforcing is to keep right. people from not smoking. So they should not be smoking. I mean, that might be just a... a a notice that you send out, Patrick, because I'm assuming they're doing it if, if, if Alexi is saying he's seen it. So it just might be a refresher to say, hey, listen, it's illegal to smoke in the parks. That means you too. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, but that that would be great. All right. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you for speaking up. Taylor. Can you hear me OK? Hi, this is Taylor, um, a resident of Battery Park City and um, I guess I just wanted to share quickly that I've had positive experiences with the ambassadors myself and have seen many ambassadors in the evenings along the Esplanade. So just to add a little, I guess, of uh, an alternative point there or side um, and have um, been able to get assistance from ambassadors when having issues that was really helpful. So um, I, I really found ambassadors really useful for me. Um, but I had a quick question on two issues that are um, really serious in my opinion or serious to me down here luckily they're not as serious as many other neighborhoods face um but they bug me and one smaller one um the noise of car exhausts um 
even on South End Avenue. I know there's not much we can do about West Street, but on South End Avenue, um, like really loud car exhaust, sometimes like these weird altered cars that can push fire out of the back of their vehicle. Um, the other is NYPD not wearing masks. So I was just wondering what um, the ambassadors could do for those two things, um, what I can do. Um, and then the third one was um, dog owners allowing their dogs on uh, no dog grass areas in the evenings. It, you know, it's not, it's not a major issue, it just bugs me. And I had mentioned it once to an ambassador like a year ago and they kind of walked away from me. And I was like, well, okay, um, I guess they can't really do much. So I was just curious, like on those three things, I guess, what can an ambassador do? What can I do um, as a resident? Thank you so much. Thanks, Taylor. Um, the first okay. two I'm going to let Patrick talk to. The, the third one, they should be telling people to put their leashes on and get off the grass, but go ahead. Uh, Taylor, uh, at night, which which park are you referring that the uh, dogs are on the grass? Are you over by Wagner Park or where? That was one of one night. I see that often. And then also on Rector Street, the oval parks on um, the two oval lawns on Rector Place. Like right outside of okay. Rector and then down the other one. Okay. Uh, just as a quick, yeah. do you recall roughly what time? Just so uh, usually can... like after nine or ten, it's in the evening. Um, okay, it's when the sun's down. I can see it out my window. Obviously, it's not a major issue. It just bugs me having dogs and not going on there and growing up and playing there. It's like, oh gosh, I know the babies go on there because they know it's dog free. So um, yeah, not, right not a problem. I mean, I can, I'll I'll have them out there uh, around that time, especially in those two locations. And if they see someone, you know, uh, doing it. I'll have uh, them be issued a ticket. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And and well, for the car exhaust one on South End Avenue, what is the best thing for me to do? I, I'm just curious. Can an ambassador do anything at all? When you say car exhaust, I think you're meaning the revving of the engines or the yeah. Uh, sorry, that, that yeah. sound. Yeah, I don't know cars that well, but that sound when they speed up, brake. It's like a popping sound, um, a really, really loud sound. It's often in the evening. And like I said, I know West Street, we can't do much about that, but it's happened multiple times on South End. One car I've seen many times now, and even parks here and then drives off. Um, so I'm just curious, can an ambassador do anything about that? Not really, other than, you know, if they happen to see it, is to speak to the individual, you know, about revving it. But you know, if you may continue to rev, uh, you know, rev the engine, but there's there's really no uh, teeth in anything to it. Uh, even a police officer, if if he was there, he'd have to sit and watch the guy do it for three minutes before he could write him a summons, and then it would be an ECB summons and run him at the off. patrol board summons. Okay, so my question then is: do, Does our neighborhood have a sound? limit like um i've seen that in other neighborhood signs for you know excessive sound and car honking and stuff i feel like this would definitely fall into that category if our neighborhood had something like that um for like ticketing for excessive sound use of a from a vehicle i'm not aware of anything like that <laughs> not the same thing yeah i mean and also the whole concept of ticketing only the as it was it five we have only the five uh, um, special patrol officers can actually give out the tickets. So part of the deal, as Andrew no noted, the difference between the ambassadors and the PEP officers is the PEP officers had guns and the PEP officers had um, ability to um, arrest and had an ability to issue tickets, which the ambassadors do not. So when Patrick says no teeth, that's kind of what he means. Not that he's looking to shoot people or whatever. I don't mean hitting me in the background, like, what are you talking about? That's not what I meant. But um, in terms of enforcement, it's a lesser level. So, so it's a lesser level of enforcement. So that would be the issue. And then hearing what about the three minutes, that's kind of crazy. It is disturbing. Okay, um, thank you so much. That's really helpful. I guess my last question would be if this uh, committee would at all be interested or willing to put forward the resolution asking for a um, you know, NYPD official um, sound um, limit. I know I've seen it in other neighborhoods, like I said, about like no honking here, fines, fines over this amount, and um, it could apply to these sounds as well. And and while maybe not many people could actually give those tickets, I think some fines are a deterrent 
Um, so anyway, interesting concept. So now, it's interesting concept. So, for all you Lucia, do. Let's make, really note of that. let's make a note of that because that's an interesting concept. It's not a bad idea. We can put the so who, who you would have to reach out to is the first precinct to the community affairs office. Speak to them. Okay, they usually handle if there's protests and they have the loud uh, loudspeakers mm -hmm. and blow horns. They usually deal with the noise complaints, dealing with that. But they can direct you as to what can and can't be done with it. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you, Taylor. Sonia's next, and I just want to let um, Andres know that I'm going to go to the go to the board next because their hands have been up for a while. Um, Jill and then Kathy. And then Andres. So go ahead, Sonia. You're on, um, Sonia. There you go. Oh, hello. Yes, hi, we hear you. Yep, we hear you. Hi, I'm a resident since 2009. I have two school age children. And I first want to comment on Patrick's. Um, I'm the one who reached out a few, uh, when that, I think it was a few days ago. Uh, with respect to the ambassador throwing something at two passerbys. Um, th they had ambassador written on the back of their jacket. Now, I, I walk like five to seven miles a day. I walk through the marina all the time. I'm well aware of that Brookfield has security and who those security off officers are. Um, this, this person had ambassador, so I know he said that they they hired a new security team. Do they have ambassador written on the back of their jacket too? Because this one had ambassador on the back of their jacket, but he says it was Brookfield security. So Brookfield has always been separate. So before Patrick, then you can answer this. They've always been separate. They 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 patrol the marina area. So they're the ones who will be telling you get off your bicycle. Oh, right. I, I, it, yeah, I know who they are. Okay, that's I, who that's who he's talking about. But now, Patrick, please answer because that's that's considered he was throwing things at people. Why? Or do you know? He was throwing. He was throwing like it looked like crumpled. Pe I I I had just approached as they were arguing, and a couple was passing, and he was his back was turned towards me. So I saw ambassador on the back of his jacket. So that's why I reached out to Patrick and Nick. But Patrick is saying that that was Brookfield security. But to my knowledge, Brookfield security doesn't have ambassador written on the back of their jacket. No, hey, so, go ahead, Pat. Go I'll ahead. you start out. Uh, so thanks, Sonia. Uh, it's Nick Spordone. How are you? Um, Hi. Good, I, I had a chance to respond. Oh, thank you uh, a little earlier. Um, I want to be clear. I, I don't think that we're saying it was Brookfield security. What we're saying is. It wasn't an ambassador, as far as we can tell, because we don't patrol the area, and it wasn't an ambassador walking to or from his or her post through the area. What we did say is Brookfield has a uniform presence in that area. It doesn't mean who you saw was Brookfield. It means we don't have an indication to think that it was any one of our ambassadors. I'm not, that's different than saying it was Brookfield. I don't want to point a finger at Brookfield. But yeah, I did no, send okay, you I, information I about Alex at Brookfield who should be able to look into it further for you and uh, whether it was his person or not. Well, Nick, can we help do that? Because that's disturbing. To look I mean, into it. I mean, I mean, you're, you're, maybe it's me, the board, to look into it. Is that something that, that could be done just to see? I don't like the idea of someone having that interaction with a, with a community member, whether it's a field, sure. whether it's I'm, ally. What can we do with this? I mean, I sent it to, I sent uh, Sonia the information. I can send it to Alex as well. You're welcome to do it. I know we're all, we're all busy folks. Not that I want to give this short shrift. You know, it's, I, I don't, well, you don't need do to, a... you don't need to contact Alex in addition to Sonia contacting him or me contacting him, but you're no, welcome no, to, No, no, I want to do like. it separately because I know nothing. But Sonia, maybe if, if you reach out, please copy me. And I'd like to be just, I mean, I'm just commenting here because they did have ambassador on the back of their jacket and it was someone who was obviously stationed there. It wasn't someone that was walking by. He seemed to be he seemed to be at a post. So that's why I reached out to Nick and Patrick. Well, but, yeah. you know. so when you when you say at a post, I'm curious as to where exactly was the person was the safety ambassador? At at oh like at the bottom of the ramp where when pj clark's on the pj clark side 
Mm. Like when you're coming out, when you're passing PJ Clark's and PJ Clark's is on your right, and you go up the ramp to walk west towards the river, he was he was standing right there, and he wasn't moving as he was throwing something at them. He just had his back towards them. I mean, he, he just was throwing something as if he was stationed there. So he was he was on the bottom of the ramp, like with a sign said, "Get off your bike." Yes, yes. exactly, right there. That. Okay, I'll I'll end up interviewing everybody that worked that day to to find out. I just would like to know, and I guess I'd like the, part of what I find so valuable about Allied is the fact that we have community police. Uh, we have like a neighborhood police and and community police in our community, and this kind of accountability is just exactly what is is wonderful about what I would be getting out of Allied. So thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Sonia, for bringing it forward. Um, uh, this is this is yes. a follow up that I think is important just to get down to the bottom of it and figure it out. Find out what um, it could have been the, the people's fault. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but. You know, the person is, is, is working and supposed to supposed to be a professional. So it, whatever, even if it was the people's fault, it's, it's still something that's not really acceptable. Correct. And well, yeah. the, the reason, one of the reasons why I asked uh, specifically where it was is because I know the supervisor and a safety ambassador was dealing with somebody who uh, they had a bicycle incident on the Esplanade and the person was busy uh, swinging an object at everybody and cursing at everybody as they were going along. So uh, they had to ask them to leave. But that would be two of them. So you should have saw two uh, two people in a jacket. But that was on the opposite side from where you're telling me this occurred. So uh, I'll end up interviewing everybody that worked that day on that shift and, and find out. And you have that information, the day and the, and the basic time from Sonia? Oh, yeah. Okay. There's, there's yeah. post assignment sheets. I know everybody that works. So oh, yeah, and you know when Sonia sent it. Well, Sonia, thank you. Yeah, this is Sonia a very helpfully sent that conversation so, I uh, wanted to have. We'll take so I'm hoping I, that other people who have something to say, please speak up. Please raise your hand and speak up. But go ahead, Sonia. Were you going to say something else? I also just wanted to comment quickly on the, I think it was Taylor who spoke about the, the dogs like at night. I mean, I've seen dogs. It, I, the, when the parks police were present, I saw them telling people, your dog can't go there. Your dog, you know, telling people they can't smoke. I don't see that anymore. I don't see people telling people this is a park. You're not allowed to smoke. I mean, people are smoking weed. People are smoking cigarettes. Dogs are just playfully running on West Thames turf, um, you know, all hours. And then I also, with another member of the community, helped to clean up dog feces a, a few weeks ago um, when ambassadors, three of them came out. One of them said he was a supervisor. They had no masks on. They were about six inches from me. I had a mask on. And he's telling me that kids should not be going in the garden bed. I don't even know. My, my kids weren't in the garden bed, but that's not really an, an acceptable you know, response to someone who's just trying to, like, clean up because it was being smeared everywhere on the turf. What would, well, okay, so this is a combination I'd like to have. What would you expect the ambassadors to do? And what would be, a, I mean, and I'm asking that of you, but also of Patrick, and, and what can we do to, to solve the problem? I'm assuming it's dog feces. And yes, the kids, uh, it's gross that someone would let their dog go there and not pick it up. That's disgusting and, and wrong. Um, but what, what can we do with that? Well, they told me they told me they were calling maintenance and they told a few other residents who went into the office that they were calling maintenance, but maintenance wasn't picking up. And finally, three hours later, just two and a half hours later, we just decided that we had to clean it up ourselves because there were all these little kids running around. And, uh, you know, it's a health hazard. Yeah, it's, it's gross. I mean, it's it's, it's disgusting. Maintenance, and it's maintenance did show up. They they and they told us that maintenance left, but maintenance did did not leave. They came when it was too late when we had just cleaned up. Hmm. It took them three hours to get there, and this was during the daytime, so they were on when they yeah, were. Yeah, this was like late afternoon, so. I just have to answer that because yeah. they they did call they did call for maintenance, 
Okay, it's documented. And they did email maintenance. And there is a report maintenance showed up uh, approximately 40 minutes later from from the time of the email. Okay. No, they didn't. Well, from the time of the email might have been time. later than the time of the report. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm just letting you know what it is and uh, what we have as, as documented. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not doubting that they didn't call maintenance. I'm just telling what happened, that it was over two hours and we finally decided we have to clean it up. It was getting dark. And then, ma and then maintenance did show up about 7, 7.30 or something like that. I don't remember the exact time. It was dark when they showed up. We were trying to get it cleaned up before it got dark because kids were still running around and it was a warm day. Um, you know, I didn't say it was their responsibility. I'm just saying, you know, and I don't doubt that they didn't call maintenance. I'm just telling you what happened. But well, I guess. I did, but I did. I was. I was not happy with the way these three ambassadors came out, not wearing masks, approached me and this other mom and said, kids should not be running across the garden bed. And then said to me, you're a resident. You should be telling people that they shouldn't be walking their dogs where they're not supposed to be walking their dogs. That's what, that's what, the, that's what he said to me. No, that's what, so just for the record, Patrick, that's what we're asking the ambassadors to do if they're around to tell people not to walk their dogs. That That is a certainly within their job description and shouldn't fall on residents unless they really feel the need to do that. Um, Sonia, thank you for speaking up. Sure. Um, um, I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't know that I have a solution, but what I will tell you next time is call me. You have my phone number. I believe. Okay, thank you. You call thank me you. next time and yeah, I, I will, I'd like to be involved real time. So thank you. Okay. okay so, you're welcome. So next would be um, Jill and then Kathy and then um, Andre. Hi. Yeah, my camera's not working, so I apologize. Um, two part question. The first part touches a little bit on what Taylor had, had mentioned. Um, it's a question about scope of services for the ambassadors and has to do with a lot of the traffic issues on South End Avenue. Um, a little bit less since the pandemic uh, because uh, there's less buses, but does it fall within their scope when you see a lot of buses and double parking and idling? For us to call 311, 311, it, it'll take forever and it's just not a, a, a process that could be done in the moment. Does it fall within their scope of services to tell those buses to not double park and not to idle? I can take the, the first crack and then Pat can follow up with what happens on the ground. But um, the vehicle and traffic law, which which governs some of the, the um, like the moving violations and the, the parking violations um, are not part of the special patrol officer's scope. The, Police Department did not give the special patrol officers that that ability. At the same time, something that the ambassadors do regularly is to simply ask for folks to to move along. It happens a lot at the the southern end of South End Avenue, that sort of cul-de-sac there, where folks often um, sit or idle um, there. And um, you know, I, I, I see reports almost daily of them simply just asking them to no longer idle there and nine times out of ten I would say they, they move along. So to that extent um, it's within their scope to ask folks to stop breaking the rule. Um, but in terms of actually writing a ticket for it it's it's not. Okay. But but in terms of, of I've seen buses parking, you know, sort of du double parking at the uh, bus stops. And after one of our neighbors was killed by a bus because her the view was obscured by two buses, I, I think it's a major safety issue in this, this neighborhood. Is there a way for people in this neighborhood to know how to contact an ambassador in such a situation or another one? Is there a way to have a phone number for, to contact the ambassador office, uh, put on the signage, you know, Battery Park, uh, uh, City Parks has signage all over. Would it make sense? Would it help the neighborhood? Would it address some of these issues when people cannot find an ambassador and need one? Here is the number of the office. If you need an ambassador, call this number. Yes, for sure. And the number is, is 
nine four five safe or seven two three three. We try to post it as every, everywhere we can, where everywhere we can find. But if you want to to jot it down, it's it's two one two nine four five safe. So if we if we get that, uh, make sure it's in all of those uh, whatever you call the signage things they have all over for the park. Is that something we might do, and that might help people? Yeah, I can I can speak to to Craig Hudon who manages the those signs, and well, Nick's here, so we can advocate to Nick in real time. Um, but including the ambassadors' numbers uh, is certainly something we can discuss in time. Okay. The second part of my question has to do with the ambassadors themselves, and oftentimes, especially in the, you know, part of the winter, I look out my window and I see uh, the ambassadors in the freezing cold, in the snow, on the on the esplanade, and and you know, checking in and and walking. I'm curious to know, um, because also just thinking as as a for, you know someone who had employed people who in the past. Is I'm curious, what is the turnover? What is the length of uh, employment for the ambassadors? And I'm particularly talking about the, you know, the folks who are out walking uh, the parks and the streets. Also, is this a minimum wage job? What does their salary look like? And what kind of incentives do they receive for, for doing good work? Pat, do you want to take it or can I? I can. Take the first crack if you want, or since they're your employees, you can. can respond. Yeah, you can take the you can take the first crack. Good. All right. Um, with regards to to tenure, I would sort of bifurcate the the um, the roster. There are some folks who have been on our project since literally the first day of the project back in I think it was 2016. Um, and those folks, um, in in many instances, have have been promoted to supervisor or to special patrol officer as a result of um, being being great at their jobs and and sticking around. So to the extent that there's opportunities for growth in the role, that's one way that I think Pat. I don't again. I don't want to speak for him. He's right here, so he can speak for himself. Um, but one way that he's retained talented folks. There's also some folks that, as as you just mentioned, you know, it's a really, really tough job that, you know, if it's bleeding out for four days straight and you, um, you're you required to walk the streets, um, some folks decide that it's it's not for them um, and they, you know, and they choose employment elsewhere. And so there's some folks who have turned over relatively quickly. Um, but then there are, I would say, lots more. If I remember correctly, the last time Pat and I pulled the numbers, it was like the of the Allied staff separating out the subcontractor that that works for Allied. Um, of the Allied staff, the the mode tenure was the full duration of the project. So, um, the, the if you were to just randomly encounter an ambassador, the you would more often um, than any other instance encounter someone who's been on the project the, the entire time. And then with regards to, um, sorry, you're, you had a last question and I'm now blanking on it. Oh, it was about wages. Um, yes. It's a prevailing wage position um, that's, that's governed by a, a city mandated prevailing wage schedule. And is that minimum premium? Um, minimum, premium, minimum wage, or is it just different levels for different positions? It's different, it's different levels for different employees, but it's it's published by the controller's office. You could, you could see, but it's it's high, higher than minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pat, how did I do? You did excellent. You got the job. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, Jill. All right, next, Kathy. Tammy, I, unless you like wave at me somehow and tell me you, you want me to break you and make you go first, I'm going to go with the order that of people who come in order. So it would be Kathy, Andres, Sarah, Amy, and then Tammy. But you're free to wave at me or send an email message to Lucian and he can go first. Thank you. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, so I was late and I apologize if this was addressed earlier in the meeting. 
But um, I'm wondering if there is an overall communications plan of any kind on the work that Ally does or just public information. Um, you know, I'm, I've lived here for a while. I come, I'm at these meetings, obviously. I know to keep the Allied number in my cell phone. I would bet that no one else on my floor does that um, or knows, you know, I hear comments like they're always looking at their cell phones and they don't know that that's kind of a way of checking in and, and reporting. Uh, it would be great following up on what Bob said to have an occasional um, meet Officer Rodriguez or, or some kind of a profile in the local paper. If you have a story like helping a lost child find their parents, you know, what a great profile, it's some good work they do. Um, and just, you know, we had a lot of discussion about Allied when the contract first flipped, but since then there's been almost nothing out there. Lots of new people in the neighborhood. Um, you know, the signs don't necessarily, they should be in the parks, but why don't the doorman's desks have a little tent that says if you see something in the park, you know, call this number for, you know, a little while. And so I'm just putting it out there and to think about and wondering how you see it. Yeah, on the, on the sort of public affairs front, I would want to defer to Nick, but I will say that I'm trying to think through the, is there a frog on the line? Are you folks hearing a ribbon? That might be me, I'll mute myself. Okay, you have a pet, Matthew? It's those wonderful gateway oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> speeders. Exactly. Go ahead, go ahead, Eric. Got it. Um, uh, I think it's important for us to try to strike the balance between if you if you see something, again, to the extent that it's an urgent issue, we, we want the message to be that folks should call 911. And so I wouldn't want to do anything that could detract from that overarching message. At the same time, I, I take your point that there needs to be a, a greater understanding in the community about allies role, which I think I again commend the chair for um, having this meeting to discuss. Um, but also maybe, you know, maybe Nick, we could reach out to property managers and provide some information um, to the buildings on, you know, what exactly they should be contacting the command center desk for. Um, and that we could sort of align that better, but I wouldn't want someone to say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm witnessing a crime. I'll call the command center and they'll address this issue. Right? No, that's not their role. That makes sense. But that's also part of the communication of, of. Once they realize it's not their role, people are told that that's not what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's right. I, so, um. Yeah, we make it a point, and thank you, uh, Kathy and Jill. So, I make it a point every month when I'm here in front of the committee, and as a standing item in my report, I have information about the first precinct, the NCOs, and about Allied. And every month is uh, printed the phone number and the email address and the physical address. Um, now, again, that just gets us to the point where people who are attending these meetings regularly or checking the reports see it. But again, every little bit helps, right? Every time I get an email from a member of the community, like, um, you know, hey, there's an incident going on in the neighborhood about issue A, B, or C, I will, uh, you know, oftentimes be sending that to Pat unless he's already copied on it and reminding folks that thank you. And then, you know, thanks for reaching out to me. You can always reach me because I'm available, any, obviously, anytime. But for quality of life type issues like this, please call, email, or visit in person. So every time I get the opportunity, I try to, I try to push that out. Um, and I'd be very surprised. If, I'd be very surprised if building managers didn't know how to contact Allied, but that's just me. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's so. Um, we're in general contact with the building managers anyway. We could make another pass and ensure that they are um, the building clear manager. Kind of what Allied does and how to contact them. And you know, I don't know that we can tell them to, to post the sign. That we can compel them to do it, but it's not a bad idea. Sure. Again, just like like Eric said, though, I don't want to. I don't want to think have people think that calling Allied is a substitute for nine one one, right? A, a crime in progress or an emergency situation, different. first move should always be whether it be Justine Cucci, Nick Spordone, or Allied or anyone else. Your first move should be nine one one. 
No. For that vast gray area where, you know, I can use an assist with something. I need a walk home or there's a dog on the lawn or there's graffiti or, you know, quality of life type things, noise complaints that are not an emergency of nature. Then sure. Allied is the people, allies, the number you should call or contact. And then they can be there and assist and kind of make that, that, that determination whether or not it needs to be escalated um, to the first precinct or elsewhere. So, yeah, we, we can uh, we'll take a pass with the buildings as well. Um, and, you know, we're always happy to give exposure to the great men and women of Allied who are doing their jobs. But we also, you know, they do their jobs with or without the recognition. So uh, it's a good point, though. If there's an opportunity to get a profile for someone who does a great job, then we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to look past that. Yeah, that, I mean, in, in your report where you have like the, the you, you focus on a person for the month, that would be a good thing. But also, I suggest that beyond just the building managers who don't always talk to the people, um, maybe perhaps the boards. And, and I noticed in the attendee list a few um, names that I recognize from, from uh, boards of buildings in the neighborhood. Um, maybe that's a conversation that they want to have with their boards to say, inviting. The Battery Park City Authority to come to a board meeting and say, "Hey, who are you? What's going on?" and and have Patrick come. And they happen once a year, so it's not like it's a lot. Although I guess with eighteen buildings, that might be eighteen more days of your life. But, um, <laughs> you know, but whatever. And not everybody would want to do it, but that's hey, a concept. You know, and it's we can what we do. It's, it's what yeah. we do. If boards if boards want to invite us, we will. We would be happy to. Yeah. Uh, so that's thank to you. Attend schedule for meeting. Sure. I mean, that's that's, that's what we do. We want to uh, be. We're here to serve. The, the other thing that I wanted to mention in regards to that, Justine, we do what's called the emergency residential radio checks. So all of these builder managers right, right. were issued uh, radios yeah, by yeah. all the authorities. Okay, That's so that when management. something happens, so that they when something call. happens on property, the authority can transmit a message out as to uh, a direction as to either what's going on or what their response should be. No, like, for instance, the terrorist attack, yep. uh, a transmission was put out to the building managers to seal your doors, to lock yep. up all your doors until uh, the police had the area sealed off and then the arrest was made and then the message went out to uh, be all clear for them to open up. That's yeah. right. That's excellent, Pat. You know, I, I had been in the office so sporadically due to this, you know, this pandemic. That I had totally forgotten about that, but yes, that's a very good point. We would uh, we'd be sitting in the office and periodically, I think it's once a week or more, we would have just regular radio checks with the buildings to make sure that they all had their radios. And they or, all, you know, yeah. yeah, you know, for for you know, for short for that's short uh, short distance communications or uh, like that. Um, and some years ago now, I can't believe it's this long already. Maybe a year or so ago or more, Patrick and I worked with some of the schools as well to make sure that where there were gaps. Uh, for buildings that had radios or for schools that had radios that so we got them provisioned with radios as well. So that's another excellent point. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, no, that is very good. That is very good. But but that doesn't address the individual people who live here. But that's a very good point because uh, it's nice to know the buildings are connected. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to... Um, so Andres took his hand down and disappeared. Um, Andres, are you there? Do you want to speak? Is he still on online? I, he chatted with me. I think he's going to raise his hand uh, for item four. Oh, okay. I really for promise four. we're going to get there. So speaking of which, we do have other things to talk about. Um, it's 7.30. We started late. I want to give this 10 more minutes or so, but I see that, um, okay, Sonia spoke already. We've got Amy, but I did say that um, Sarah and Tammy and then Amy, if that's okay. Just I'm doing it in the order of hands raised. So Sarah first, Sarah Cassell. Hi, I'm just curious about um, subcontractors. You've mentioned subcontractors several times. So Battery Park City Authority hires Allied, and then Allied hires subcontractors? Is that what's happening? Yes, yeah, so as, as part of our minority and women-owned business enterprise and service disabled veteran-owned business, Goals. We have um, uh, goals as, as an authority across the board for prime contractors to subcontract with um, organizations that, that fit those criteria and are certified by the state. And so, um, as part of the, um, the procurement that we did last year, um, we 
required um, a, it's a 30% goal for MWBE and 6% goal for service disabled veteran owned businesses. And so they, um, Ally presented their, their project team with us um, when, they, when they interviewed with us. And so, um, you know, 30% of the ambassador uh, hours that you encounter in the parks are, are run by a, a minority and women owned business enterprise city safe partners. Okay, are they trained by Allied or do they come trained? I, I was just curious as to the standards. Yep, Pat, you can speak more to this. I will say that they're, they all are required to take the, the state's um, um, sec, you know, security officer training. But Pat, do you want to speak a little bit more to what City Safe requires of their employees? Oh yeah, when uh, a city safe employee, they have to take the eight hour and 16 hour state uh, test and they have to uh, maintain their license, which requires them to take an eight hour course every year. Uh, also, when they come on site, uh, they go through desktop training. Uh, basically at the start of the project, the authority uh, set up training for us up on up, uh, management and the first set of safety ambassadors. And what we did was we created uh, slides added at training after videoing it. And that's a desktop training. It's about approximately six uh, different presentations, including the uh, history of the park and all the park rules and uh, the breakdown. And then when uh, they go out, just like any allied uh, safety ambassador, supervisor goes out with them when they're new, uh, shows them the posts, shows them where all the uh, geotags are located. Oh, and, it's okay. Uh, I, I believe that they're trained. I was just curious and the way they were referred to instead of being allied employees, but as subcontractors was confusing. Okay, but uh, put it this way, our supervisors supervise them, okay? And if there's any issue, the issues are taken care of right away. Great, thank so, you. You're welcome. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Tammy, thank you for being patient. And then Amy. Yes, thank you. Um, I will be on video, but I've got the background because we're cooking. Um, it's a question for Patrick and sort of for Eric, um, who may jump in. When I asked about staffing levels in the spring, because we were told that staff, there wouldn't be an uptick in staffing due to COVID and the reduced usage, it was staying at the plan at the time in March and April, I believe was to stay at set levels. So I'd like to know if the new contract um, is seasonally adjusted and is that based on the labor levels used for 2019 versus 2020, looking ahead in the budget? That's my first question. My second question is, um, there was an incident uh, a couple of weeks ago, which 76 was alerted from not only a citizen's app, but also from uh, another one of the schools that there had been a man with a knife walking up and down um, towards the end of South End Avenue. I wondered what the alert system looked like between Allied and the schools, if I could find that out in terms of alert and then, you know, denial of what is happening as well, so they can be released. And then thirdly, the next, when was the contract up and renewed this year because I have a follow up question for that. So thank you. I will take questions one and three since they're contract related. And I'll just mention that I remember getting alert about that rather frightening incident on, um, I thought it was, it's Battery Place, not South End Avenue, where that incident happened, right, Tammy? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll leave Pat to respond to that specific incident. So with regards to the contract, um, we, the, the contract is for, did I lose you there or did I lose others? No, no, we hear you. I think Tim is here. Okay. I just got an alert on my, on my, on my WebEx that my connection was slow. So I wanted to make no, sure. I see you. Okay. Um, so the, the contract is for five years. 
Um, and it's what we call a not to exceed amount. So it enables us to um, to basically uh, to, to flex according to what the budget is. So the, the Board of Battery Park City Authority approves the, the budget for contracted security services annually. And um, they, they allow me to work with Pat and his team to set staffing levels, um, not just with regards to, to seasonality, but also depending on the needs that are arising in the neighborhood. And so, you know, if we if a holiday arri you know, arrives and it turns out that the kids are going to be out of school and we want to make sure that there's sufficient coverage in one park or another park or at the ball field or et cetera, then we can adjust that way um, at the risk of um, sharing what we would rather not. We, you know, we've introduced split shifts um, over the term of the contract to allow for some um, additional coverage during certain times of day where we have found that um, we needed more coverage in certain areas of the parks. And so we, we have a lot of flexibility. And again, though I won't discuss the actual numbers, I'd be happy to hear from you folks about where you see the greatest needs in the parks, both with regards to geography and with regards to time of day. And, um, you know, that's something that we as, as a team have been working on over the term of the contract to make sure that we're calibrating the staffing right. So just the last note that I'll say on, on that is that um, it's, uh, though, though Allied is a large organization that can draw on lots of resources, including on their subcontractors, to Sarah's point, um, we we do train the, the staff to make sure that um, folks aren't completely sort of approaching their job de novo. And so it sometimes can take a little bit to ramp up or ramp down. But I will say that um, this year, um, as a, to answer your first question more directly, I believe that we ramped up a bit um, in the springtime, uh, even you know, even despite COVID, just in light of the fact that we had more folks in our parks. I don't know if you remember, it feels like a decade ago, but um, we were really concerned about the park sort of being overrun in the early spring, just because folks were so eager to, to get out of their houses, um, you know, after the sort of initial initial lockdown. I apologize because I dropped the laptop in the middle of it, but did you say that the future contract is based off of um, more or less staffing levels from 2019 versus 2020? What I'm saying is that uh, it's a five-year contract and the amount of the contract is um, set for the entire five years. And so we can flex within the five years. The amount that we spend on security is set by our board as part of the annual budget process. So we make a proposal to them based on what we perceive our security needs to be, and they approve or ask for changes to that. But we're um, up until we're there. We're at it. up until 2024, we're able to um, flex within the not to exceed amount of the contract. And the contract was our contract review just this year. It was last year that we uh, we did a fresh procurement in 2019. It took effect on the 19th of November in 2019, and it expires in November 18th of 2024. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And then I, the last thing on the middle one was the incident on on Battery Place. Um, but I do see you've got the SPOs there, um, and I assume on Justine's note that there is the same number, if not more, of SPOs than we had existing from the prior contract? That's correct. So um, I, was, I was mentioning earlier, the licensing division at NYPD took a, a bit of a pause during COVID, but thankfully before that took place, um, Pat was able to get some SPOs um, trained and appointed by the, by the police department. So we don't have the full roster that we've been seeking, but not for lack of trying. And, um, you know, in, in our contract, it explicitly states the expansion of the program. And it's our, our goal to be fully staffed up as soon as the licensing division reopens the floodgates. But I so would imagine there'll be many in line. 
Yep. Eric said earlier, we have five now and we're looking to step up to 11. Many thanks. Sorry about that. No, thank you. Um, all right, so then, um, Amy. Did Amy you took your hand down? No, a a Amy should be speaking. Amy, speak. It's your turn. Take her off. The oh, yeah, her hand is still up. Sorry, it's just not showing me. So Amy is next, please. Sonia spoke already. So Lucian, unmute Amy. Uh, no, I did take my hand down. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Amy, but why not? You've got stuff to say, so please say it. <laughs> Please say um, it. Come on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, <clears throat> I, I don't think this is the appropriate forum for the things I have to say. I am um, glad that um, Sonia spoke um, because she has witnessed some things and raised her hand. I'm, I'm, I think it's unfortunate that she did not get the response that I think she is due. Um, but I think that's representative of the neighborhood, which is why. I said, I mean, there should be more people on this call. As you know, Justine, I posted I on that story yeah. because people complain in social mm -hmm. media on a regular basis and not they do. two people, no, lots of not. people. So I only posted today's meeting. The fact that people did not attend, I'm disappointed by, but I think that's representative of the did lack they of faith in the response by either the authority or the allied or the community board. I don't know to whom, but it is not my role to be the voice of it. I'm just saying um, for someone like Sonia who did speak up and who I knew about the incident immediately because she was very concerned. Mm -hmm. if she says and reports to the authority and to the allied responsible people that a person with a jacket that says ambassador. And I specifically asked her that when she wrote to me and said this happened in the incident. And I said, yellow jackets, you know, it might've been security. If she says it's ambassador, it's an ambassador. The answer is we will look into it. Yeah, and in I guess that's life, what... in a former life I had a business and I had contractors who I outsourced products to. If my client called me with a complaint revolving an incident or something, a transaction with my vendor, my answer was I own it. I'm sorry. I will look into it, and we will get back to you with a resolution. It yes. wasn't. Well, see, I agree with that. It wasn't a defense. It wasn't a give me more, prove it mm -hmm. to me. And that's where the disconnect that I have is, which is why I took my hand down. So I'm going to take my hand down and stop talking because that's my disconnect consistently. And I appreciate Eric and Nick and Patrick, all the conversations that we have. But we're still in that same place where residents are saying, this is my concern or this is what I have seen. And unless they also live here and walk the same streets to have them invalidated or to have their responses perceived as they need to prove is to me not the mission statement of the Battery Park City Authority nor nope. upholding the contract that they have signed on behalf of the residents with Allied. So with th that's all I'm gonna say. I have no more complaints. I appreciate everyone speaking. I wish more residents did, but I think this I this needs to go beyond the community board. No disrespect to community board, but and I appreciate all you do. Truly, no. Justine, for raising this, and I'm sorry more people didn't come to the table. Okay, wait, it. Nick, before you speak, let me say something. So first of all, Amy, thank you. Number one, no disrespect taken towards me. Um, I appreciate your frustration. I will attest to the fact that after Amy brought some of this to my attention and, and her frustration to my attention, I signed up for that neighborhood chat that she's talking about, whatever it's called, and she is correct. There is a lot of vehement complaints about things, and one of one is some of the stuff that was compl is complained about. I believe some is not within the purview of what the job is of the ambassadors. And I we're going so late now. Part of the conversation has to do with homeless people, and we're not we haven't gotten to that. Um, which is what but we're, 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 my point is, but, but that's a piece, but I'm not, yeah, wait, let me finish Amy, because, because you're right. What is within the purview of the ambassadors and I'm sorry, with, of, of, of the battery Park City authority and allied is responding in a way that solves the problem. So, so where I was trying to go with Sonia and what I want to, I feel as if I thought we got there, but, um, we didn't get there. 
at least from the position of the community who are listening on the phone. Um, I, the incident of, of the ambassador, whether it's Brookfield or whether it is Allied Universal, is the responsibility of the Battery Park City Authority to figure out. Having a email sent back to Sonia saying you contact Brookfield, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm going to say this because I didn't make it clear. That's not acceptable. I would like that. And I'm going to have to. I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to yeah. have to reply. Oh, off. please do. No, finish, that's but, okay. Because okay. I know you're going to be frustrated, and I know you're no, not. No, 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 no. But my I'm feeling about that Look, is, this is that this is something that is obviously very serious. It government, is government is serious work. Yeah. For serious people, I've dedicated my career to service, and the good Lord willing, I'll continue to do so for as uh, as long as I'm I'm had anywhere that will have me. Uh, Amy, I would respectfully disagree that people don't have faith in our response and if they they do they shouldn't i'm here every month i've been here every month for the past 50 something months at the battery park city committee every month often with a 10 page report answering any and all questions every month our board meets with a public comment session we have this past year about three dozen or so public hearings most of which were on targeted topics like resiliency sustainability but my name is nick spordone I'm at 646-531-2276. You can reach me by phone, by email. My contact information is at the top of every report. Sometimes people like to complain and they don't necessarily like to show up. I'm not saying that's the case now, but we're here every month and we will continue to be here every month so long as the community continues to have us. Amy, we've had lengthy conversations. I value them. I know sometimes that we you know, go back and forth like siblings, but that's all part of the process. We're committed to making sure this neighborhood is as good as it can be. And frankly, it is the best neighborhood in New York City, if I might say so myself. I don't live in it, but I've seen the work that goes into keeping this neighborhood absolutely top notch. But could I um, just as a sort of yeah, point yeah. though, Nick, I think it's important and for the us other, to the just, other thing I would sorry. add on, on Sonia, I'm sorry, just on Sonia is and thank you for the note. So Sonia emailed us Monday morning. I sent it over to Pat within a few minutes. The first time I have heard that the fellow was wearing a jacket with the word ambassador on it was this evening at this meeting. It was not included in Sonia's original note, and I can okay. send it just in if you'd like to see it. No, no, it I was, believe you. Here's what happened, here was the location, and here was the description of it. I sent it to Pat, and Pat noted, we do not have anyone stationed in that area. That is not where we have people stationed. Moreover, we don't have anyone who was in that area associated with with the Allied ambassadors during the time when Sonia reported it. So that's what I wrote back to Sonia and I said, you know, there is a uniform presence that Brookfield has there. You may, you may, want, to, you may want to check with them, but this, this is, as far as I'm seeing, not ours. Now, new information has been introduced where the assertion is that, well, the person is wearing an ambassador jacket. Okay, Patrick said, which I hope is a sufficient response. Okay, I will sit and I will interview every one of the people who I have on staff. Now. I don't know what uniforms that people wear who are not. Maybe there are other people who wear ambassador jackets. I don't know. I, I but don't the know suggestion either. that we are not taking this seriously or okay. that we are dismissing it out of hand is okay. absolutely untrue. And I would like the record to reflect that, that we responded fulsomely uh, and timely. And we will okay. continue to examine to make sure that it wasn't uh, an ambassador, and if it was, then Patrick and Eric will take the but appropriate I guess, action. Nick, wait, sorry, can I just interject? Um, yeah. And, and I, cause I said, I really, like I said, I have told Justine, I've told Lucci in this, I really don't think this is, the, the community board is the proper forum to address personally this issue for me. I think it needs to escalate. But what you're saying, Nick, and you and I have talked for years, and you know I like you, and you're a great guy, I, uh, and you are like great you at what you do, but Yes, we have this stance. You just reinforced what I'm saying. The fact that you are now saying that this is the first time you heard ambassador tonight. My response is exactly what I just said about the residents not being heard. If Sonia or Jane Doe wrote you and said, this is what I just saw with a yellow jacket, security, whatever, and I think this is a problem. The first response to me as a representative for the neighborhood would be, what did the jack was it sorry did you actually see did the jacket say security did the jacket say ambassador 
She, right. I, I I'm saying she didn't write to me and say anything about a jacket. Email. I she believe she, she wrote that, but I'm just saying. She did not say you're... anything about a jacket, Amy, is what I'm saying to you. She said there was a person, there was an ambassador at this particular yeah. place Again, and time. But that's my point, and I told Nick. her, Why do we thank you for the that? note, but we don't we... have ambassadors there. Right, so that's residents... like somebody saying, I had an issue with somebody in Battery Park. I can't tell you how many times it happens. And I have to say, thank you so much for the note. Battery Park City is not Battery Park. Here are the people in Battery Park who can help you. My Nick, goal is to make sure okay, people okay, have wait. the answers both they you, need. Both of you, but stop. I cannot I tell Robert's, Robert's help someone Robert's if rules. I don't Let me interrupt. have the appropriate Robert's information. Rules. Robert's, yes. Let me stop this now. Amy, I hear you. I hear what you're saying, and I'm not sure that Nick hears what you're saying because he's... Eric was cut off. Off. Justine. Say again, what? Eric was cut off. I know. I'd like to. Eric, sure. I'm going to let Eric speak because I think that Nick is feeling attacked, and that's not what my point was. So, so Eric, if you want to speak and, and answer this, that would be great because then I have something to say because I think that there's I'm a disconnect. Myself. Understanding. Everybody, I'm muting myself. I appreciate it. I will listen from now on, but I'm muting myself. I appreciate you all. No, thank you, Amy. Go ahead, Eric. You may speak. No, I think Nick mainly made my point, which was just to say that as at. When I first heard about this incident and I heard that something had happened at the bottom of those steps there, um, I, I just know that that is a spot where the, the Brookfield security are posted up. And so when they investigated it and, and, you know, Nick and Pat asked for the additional information, it sort of didn't come as a surprise that they suspected that it was um, a, a Brookfield security incident. But I was glad that this evening when we heard the additional information that um, that Pat said that he was going to investigate it further. And so I was just similar to Nick's response was just taking issue with the characterization that we were um, not going to address the issue. Cause I think that again, I don't want any uh, park user or resident in the community to have anything thrown at them by anyone. Um, and um, to the extent that it happens, I want to play a role and I want the authority to play a role in fixing it. Um, but it's just, it was important to me to make sure that it was clear that we, we are going to address it further. So a couple of things, and then I'm going to close the conversation on this. We'll move on. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the people who spoke. Thank you to everybody in answer to make clear what I'm saying. And when I, when I was saying to this is if that incident happened, whether it was Brookfield security or allied. It still needs to be addressed. Now, what I'm going to say at this moment in time is if this happened Monday, and today is Wednesday, time passes. Nobody, it, it does take time to investigate this and give everybody a chance. I am so thankful that Amy showed up and that Sonia showed up and she brought this all to our attention tonight because it's important that we're talking about it. We just found out some more information and it's really useful. I, um, I, um, want to make it 100% clear that I am not attacking anyone. Everybody here is doing their job. Everyone is trying to do a good thing. What I want to express on the behalf of the community who has been complaining at least, and I'm speaking in their voice, not necessarily mine because I have not had this experience particularly, but there are people in the community, in the Battery Park City community, who feel as if they say something and then they're told why they're wrong. And that is something that maybe it's not the community board's job to get involved in, but I just would like the authority to hear that and sit with it. And I know that bothers you. I can see your faces, both of I can see Eric and I can see Nick. I know that that sentence bothers you. I'm not saying that it's a true sentence. I'm telling you how people feel. And that in and of itself is valid. And so I'm acknowledging the feelings of Amy. I'm acknowledging the feelings of Sonia and I'm acknowledging your discomfort with those feelings. So what I say now is let's shut this down for the conversation. It's eight o'clock. Let us talk further offline and let us keep going on this conversation. Because once again, I heard a lot of really great things about Ally. I think that the relationship between the Battery Park City Authority and the community is, is commendable. The communication level is great. You, Nick has been at almost every meeting, at every meeting. Patrick has been at every meeting that we've had. I appreciate your being here. You are always full forthright with your answers. You tell us what you can and can't do. And a lot of times it's, I don't know, and that's okay. Because you do get back to me or you do get back to us as a committee. So thank you for that. But Amy and Sonia, don't stop. Don't stop um, having your concerns because you deserve to be heard. And if your feelings are what your feelings are, they're valid. 
They're valid because you feel them. So I want to acknowledge that. Let's move on. What's next? And thank you all for this part of the conversation, but I think we're moving to the sheds next. Is that correct? And I know there's a bunch of people in the attendee list who have been waiting patiently for sheds. Lucian, you're up. I believe it's peer A update. Oh, peer, you know what? Could we do sheds next and then go peer A? Because I think, I don't think anybody on the attendee list is here to speak to sheds. I'm sorry, to speak to peer A. I think we're going to hear from Nick about that, which is interesting and people can stay on, but I'd like to have the people who've signed on to talk about the sheds. I'd like to hear their input. As you were, Nick, Nick uh, are, are you, can, can we pivot to sheds? Are you okay with that? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Treasure being, I just, beating you up, so now I'm beating you up more. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's I just, it's completely fine. Just for the record, for the last one, just I, only because I checked with Pat during the conversation, I just want it to be in the, in the transcript. As far as I understand, and as far as Pat understands, it came up a couple of times. The PEP officers, when they were here, and I believe it's still the case, they were not armed. Armed, I mean, with oh. firearms. Okay. They, they had the said, I understand it. Got but it. Not, not a, uh, not a weapon uh, of that caliber. No pun intended. Okay. Just so Thank we have you. it. No, no, thank you for the record of correcting me. Thank you. All right, let's talk about the equipment sheds on the Battery Park City side of West Street. Um, Nick, I may ask you to um, just give us the history of why they have to be there because you'll do a better job than I will. Just, just to interrupt Nick for a sec, I wanted to say that they were armed and the guys in the car, I think, I'm, I'm sure were armed because I had lots of interactions with them over many years. So they did carry guns. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for saying that. Um, but uh, let's go on to the um, sheds, please. So they're there. Tell us what the purpose is and where the options are if you have that information at this point that were presented. Because I know when it, they came up at a, a environmental committee meeting, you guys were pretty much blindsided like we were with the fact that they had to be installed. So now we want to figure out how we can make it the lesser of all evils. Well, so I, we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday, Justine, just for the benefit of the, of the committee, and I'm by far, uh, or I should say, I'm far from an expert on this. I'm not an engineer or a, uh, architect or designer, but I'll start by saying we being Battery Park City Authority, we're still kind of in the throes of kind of technical and legal and ownership discussions with both DEP and DOT about uh, many of the issues, including what are known as these kind of control houses. Um, we will be, as I think there was some conversation at the start of the meeting, kind of before we started, about um, our next engagement with the Environmental Protection Committee. So maybe the way to do this is kind of take a step back. So we have Biden uh, periodically first through the Battery Park City Committee and then recently or so past year or so it's extended out and through the Environmental Protection Committee as kind of resiliency overall and lower Manhattan kind of comes into their bailiwick. So we'll be back to the Environmental Protection Committee in early 2021, probably probably February or so with a number of follow up items. We owe them on issues that we've been talking around for for some time, right? Battery bikeway, um, the back kind of house, the back of house entrance on the, the berm in, uh, or, or kind of the structure in, in Wagner Park. Um, from the seating areas on the lawn. I know that Tammy had brought up uh, bike lanes through that area, et cetera, uh, as, as well as uh, environmental reviews and the schedule for that. Um, Part of this is a function of, we had discussed this, I think, on the LMCR meeting recently with the community uh, board chairs and some agency are that we're now going to be doing uh, an EI, an environmental impact study for um, the South project, which is a function of that will not, you know, to a tremendous extent, but we'll push the time bank, timeline back a little bit in terms of the beginning of construction on the South Battery Park City project to uh, at the earliest November 2021, that's construction in the park. So with that are a lot of these discussions around interior drainage, which is where the control houses come in, et cetera. All long way of saying, we'll be back to the Environmental Protection Committee early next year, where we would have kind of a firm grasp on the form and the 
what this interior range is going to look like. Benefit of the committee tonight, however, the best way I can explain it again, as a, not as a designer, an architect, or an engineer, but as a, as a who should I send you a link earlier? If you want to maybe bring it up? You don't just bring that up. We did a presentation to the environmental committee back in June um, where we discussed kind of the concept of control houses. And in the main, what a control house is, it's a it's a house. It's housing for equipment that will control um, these gates that uh, will close off access to these main sewer lines that basically up my highway. So there's a map starting on that presentation. I'll bring it up on my end as well. Along the West Side Highway, there's a huge pipe that all the buildings, sewage and water kind of runs into. I'm maybe not using the right terms, but all the kind of this 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 from the buildings come in from the road and uh, around. And since we are having uh, contemplating the resiliency members being laid atop that or near it, we essentially need to have infrastructure gates that can open it. Dry side of the protection from the west side of the protection in the midst of a flood event. So flood waters overflowing or running. Equipment that is used to open closes infrastructure gates actually has to be housed above the lead. These control houses are structures within which this equipment lives. Um, there are some, yes, yeah, so Lucian, very helpfully, thank you, thank you, uh, pulled up uh, an idea of uh, what those intercept, those control houses imagine to look like. Now that this is not what they're going to look like. It's a rough concept, but resiliency recovery are contemplating for the east side coastal resiliency project and the EMCR, which is Brooklyn uh resiliency, uh, coastal resiliency. The reason why we put these as placeholders in that June presentation for now is because these were to be approved by the PPC as a example of our exercise here. Wait, be approved by whom? You broke up now. The, the the public design commission. Okay, there are uh, there they are obviously a lot of these uh these resiliency plans as well as throughout the city on on various types of projects. We as a placeholder for now, knowing that in the main the PD would like to would like to see some consistency uh, of what these houses will look like. Not saying that there's not some wiggle rooms on the margins. Right in terms of materiality, but I think what PDD would want to say. I don't want to PDD, but I understand. PDD will want to see some consistency uh, in the design. So, so when we're on the east side, and then in Battery Park City, I go one of these control houses that my name, but you would be able able to tell that they were kind of of the same family. Um, Parts of them are I mean, they're not they're not small, right? They are have here, but they are intended to be tall by, uh, um, I have it written down in my notes here, I'd have to find, excuse me for a second. Nonetheless, the discussion we had in June was a couple of different things about where this Nick, there were 40, They were 40 to 60 feet long yes. at a max of 16 foot high. Yeah, that's what your that's what this this um chart says here. This picture. Yep. And the board and the, just so you know, the CB is already on record asking for contextuality to neighborhood, not symmetry, because we don't think it should look the same in Brooklyn as it does at the historic seaport as it would in Battery Park City. Great. Again, yeah. these are the things that we we would want to hear. Yeah, no, I totally, and we're on record saying that, correct? Is there, has there been a resolution to that effect or we're just making that point? Because I think that is a very important point, Tammy. Can't wait to see the resolution. Okay, then that's good. That, that's what I want to know. All right, um, so Nick, go ahead, I'm sorry. Were you no, finished? 
I mean, that was that was that, that was the main point. The other kind of summary point for the discussion in June was that okay. motion, you can go ahead to page. I want to say maybe thirty slide. 30, 37. If you don't mind. Um, that shows kind of how tall it is, but 40, 30 to 40 feet long. That's insane. The other discussion and, I think in June was for the Southern Mobile Control House, there were a couple of options about, again, depending on, I, I, I want to carry it, I said, because I checked with, even though I know there's no answers, happy to be to the EP committee. Mm -hmm. well, this by saying that we're still working through a lot of technical um, and ownership issues of these things um, and how it's actually technically going to work. Uh, but at the time we had discussed June, the location for one of these, the Southern Control House, we identified kind of that median, right? It's like across the street with Wagner Slash. Mm -hmm. You can see on slide 37. One of the options was, I want to say, in the in the walkway right next to that. Uh, and then on slide 40, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, if you can maybe toggle, probably would be actually in the planting. I may be mixing it up. The idea was either in the planting bed or right next to the planting bed. Yeah. The conversation was, oh, can we just throw away outside of your house, which while theoretically possible, the further away it gets from the actual interceptor gate itself, the bigger it needs to be because you know, yeah. it needs to be bigger away from what we're trying to control. So there are the thing, right? I think probably we look at these options two and option three. If it's in the planting bed that walk away, why for that that cage right there, that's usually the cross section show is like twenty-four clearance. But so that's the problem. Um, Where's the bike path? So let's look at this and, and, and maybe yeah. Lucian, if you, I'm looking yeah. at it with my pointer, but maybe you can use your pointer because you've got one. The downside um, there would be it's all open, but then you would lose a couple of trees and the planting bed would be taken up. And, and this would be Little West. This is Little West Street. So wait, let's see. That's the highway. Little little West Street is, is, is the highway or no? This is the. That's Little West. Uh, and the West Side Highway is, is still farther. I repeat, so to the far left. Path. Far left. There's Got it. Path. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'm an idiot, but I just really don't see this stuff. Okay. Let's go back to the to the to the picture that shows the street, like at the top of this one, basically. There you go. This is Little West. So Little West Street's here, and then the highway is farther, like where it says interior. The word interior is. I think Basically. so, yeah. If you're looking at that picture, you'd be looking, that would be you standing on Little West Street looking south. There you go. Okay. The, so the options the are where? I, I, tell us the options are in this planter here, which is Little West Street, in the planter here, or when you say on the walkway, what do you mean on the walkway? Where is that? At 40, you'll see the same so perspective. people can see it. Yeah. You'll see the same perspective, but instead of being in the planter it's on the walkway directly to the left of the planter lucian will bring that up for you now um there so this this whole blue thing this is the top or the bottom no 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 on the on the in the picture see the orange i see so either in the in the in the in the pat in the walkway with the planting bed next to it and untouched oh, or in yep. the planting bed with the full walkway next to it and untouched okay now, all right. I'm going to ask you a question. Go ahead, Tammy first. Your, your hand has been up. So go ahead, Tammy. Several questions. One, we'd like to see modeling because what you're showing us is a picture of what it looks like on the ground. It's not representative of what yeah. a 16 foot tall, 40 feet long structure actually would look like there. Mm -hmm. Because if it's in the planting bed, you lose all the plants, all the trees. If it's in the sidewalk, what are you losing in terms of land? Okay. Do you, so we, we, I'd like to see some modeling if that's possible. Secondly, there was a discussion because on West street, there's a access lane that doesn't go anywhere. 
that's in the same spot. So on the street itself, there's kind of like a curb bump out lane. That's just, you know, sometimes you get buses who pull over there and wait as to whether or not it could be put there. So you're not losing parkland. If you're putting it in parkland, do you have to do any parkland alienation? Because that is mapped parkland. If you could get back to us on that as well. And then, all these questions and more, it is my sincere hope we will have answers for you at the EP committee meeting. Great. So one about the lane, two about modeling so people can see it, three about uh, contextuality, obviously. Um, fourth was, what was my fourth? Dang it. Contextuality, modeling, locations. If I think of it, I'll text uh, just alienation. Here. Alienate. I think you asked about alienation too. If, if, it goes in, if it goes in the promenade, what was that alienation of Parkland? Actually, the, so was that the other item? Right. Thank oh. you, Betty. Thank you. Okay. And um, the one thing that is missing from this conversation is the fact that there was a note on the diagrams that we might potentially lose the grass lawn area of West Thames um, Park. That's what? Edge. <laughs> yeah. Whether or not a second of these would be needed, which would require the removal of the entire lawn area on the south side of West Thames Park. That, uh, for lack of a better expression, it's like where all the babies sit in the grass. Yeah. Yeah. We need it's the basketball court, it's the playground, and then it's the sand pit, and then it's the grass. Correct. Want to identify it. And one of the slides showed that it would be in the area if needed, we lose the entire grass area. I don't think 40 feet would fit there. I'll pull up the presentation card because I remember that specific. I do recall that. As one of the options, and I'm going to say we've got people from the community who I know want to speak. So, Bob, I see your hand up. I know Vinton wanted to speak, and he's been here since before they started. So, Vinton Thompson, I'm going to let go first, assuming he still wants to speak. But, um, and then maybe Bob Zach wants to speak. I don't know. But the go idea ahead. The idea there was um, just on that other control house, just yeah. from my notes, was that the idea hopefully was that you we may be able to move that that second one further up um, so you still have the southern one at a location potentially again pending all the technical issues that we're still working through to that well, the, the other one that may end up being able to be put up to chamber street and function as part of the north resiliency so um, I don't but know that's that also of value and something that we're going to want to know because that that's going to affect us too. Even if it's Chamber Street, it's going to affect us. And I'm assuming. Well, I don't really know. I'm not going to assume anything. But yeah, instead of making all the pain in one part of the neighborhood, it would be nice to push some of it north. But uh, again, we need to see what these things look like. And I know you can't do it now. I appreciate that. That was clear before we started. So, um, yeah, just, let me, before, so we'll come back to you. you know, just kind of getting on it, so you have some of your ideas. Yeah. We'll be back to you with as many answers. We have we have my, my concept. So speaking to the to my board here, um, my concept for having this discussion tonight was to see what, what the and I to see what we thought about all this stuff and what the um, community living nearby these these uh, proposed uh, equipment sheds thought about it and then coming together and at least putting out it may be a, a string of resolutions, but one thing that we certainly could push for would be having a not uniform to what's going on all over the city or all over lower Manhattan, having something that is specific to Battery Park City. So if it has to be uniform, mm -hmm. uniform north and south, that's mm -hmm. it. And it might be a good piece of a resolution, but um, I don't know that we can say we don't want them. I, I, I think that, that is that ship has sailed. We need to have these equipment sheds someplace. Is is a clear statement that I'm getting from from the meetings I've attended to at the EP at the Environmental Protection Committee. So they have to happen. The question is, how do we make them happen in a way that we can function with? So with that said, um, Vincent, do you want to speak? 
you've been here longer. If not, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Bob and Tammy. You did speak. Your hand is still up, but I'm assuming. Vinton, are you there? Um, Lucian, can you un unmute? I'm him? here. Am okay, I unmuted? You are unmuted. Go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, I'm Benton Thompson, and uh, I live at uh, Street. I'm also a member of the board of directors of the residential condominium at 10 West Street. Um, we got wind of this uh, somewhat June meeting. We weren't there. I did attend, I think, one of the environmental meetings where they talked a little about it. Uh, from our point of view, the proposal to uh, this is a proposal to put a four. 60 foot long, roughly, uh, you know, 10 to 15 foot high building uh, as a wall across the street from us that would potentially take out all the greenery in front of our building that would wall us off from the uh, promenade that would create what would feel like a walled entrance to Little West Street for anybody coming up Little West Street to the buildings along Little West Street. and. Uh, while there was some indication that somebody had the impression that somebody had talked to the residents in the immediate area who standing immediately affected by this, I can guarantee you that that was not the case. Nobody came to us about this. We got wind of it accidentally. I think we're uh, strongly, strongly opposed to putting a wall on Little West Street across from our building and uh, that uh, there must be a way uh, to uh, combine aesthetics and engineering so that there's a control house somewhere, but that it, it uh, doesn't result in walling off a little West Street, which would be aesthetically ugly for the whole community, not just for us. So uh, that's my statement. I hope you'll find a way to involve the residents who live right across from this uh, proposed structure uh, in this discussion in a uh, serious way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying on the line this whole time and thank you for expressing yourself. Um, uh, I wish that there was for that. And, uh, yeah, I don't have an email. If Justine or Lucian or somebody wants to connect us, then we'll make sure they're added to our email list. We've done um, dozens of uh, resiliency meetings uh, up to this point. We're always a little more involved. In and kind of voice their feedback about the future of the community. Happy to keep you posted on those. We do advertising all we always do a better job of getting out of our meetings. So we'll connect and I'll make sure that you are all uh, looped in to the next of um, discussions. We certainly want to hear what you and the residents have. Yeah, no. Thank you, Nick. Very, very well said. Yeah, very well said. And pay attention not just to this committee because the, it's the environmental committee, environmental protection committee that deals really in depth with what's going on with the resiliency. Because the, there's architects on there. Alice Blank is amazing as understanding all this stuff. And um, I, yeah, there's just no comparison to what she understands when it's presented and and. Many of the people who are on this committee are members of that committee too, and we do show up at both. And I think there's members of the environmental um, committee online here right now. I think, but um, Justine, if I could, if I could just yeah, uh, just do. For a second, uh, and make a shameless plug for Community Board One's um, uh, weekly newsletter. Uh, I I put a, a link to our uh, sign up form in the chat, but if you sign up, you will get. Uh, the CP, I'm sorry, you hear my son uh, making noises. You get you will get uh, an update every Friday or Saturday um, of CB one's agendas and any changes to the agendas. So you will know when um, from us when this item uh, lands on the Environmental Protection Committee's uh, agenda. So that this is the best way to stay in the know of what CB one is discussing, especially if you have. Uh, an item in mind that you're especially curious or or, or um, passionate about. So um, please, uh, you can either chat the host uh, if it's if the link is in the chat, and it's also available on the uh, live.mcb1 to NYC page where you find the link to our meetings. It's, it's, if you scroll down, it's there as well. So that's my end of my plug. Thank you, Justine. Thank you, Justine. 
No, thank you. That's where I was going to go, but you have all the information. Um, okay, so next is Bob Schneck, and then I see that Bob Zach has his hand up in the attendee list. So, Bob, you first. Okay. And then Bob Schneck, uh, Bob Zach. Okay, um, thank you. I just wanted to say that I'm one of the persons that's on both of these committees. So, I'm, I am in this again, uh, advantage by lots of meetings and information. I think that it is a problem from my point of view that these solutions do such violence to a the view corridor of the wonderful promenade that was I mean if you if you're going to if you're going to damage some part of the promenade you don't damage the whole promenade and that's really an architectural uh, feature to be proud of in our neighborhood and it's really extraordinary um, I think that also the resident that complained about the really incredible disruption of the view corridor um, of the buildings. I think that's also true with such a large, uh, such a large structure. I think that uh, when in at least one or more of these discussions, the idea, you know, that there is a crossing across the West Side Highway at West Thames. And it, when you're some part of the way across there, there's this there's this really pretty big um, area in the middle of the road there where it could fit. And that was proposed. It's kind of adjacent to the kitty grass, but it's really pretty big, more than 70 feet. And it already, <laughs> it's already excavated because there's part, it, it's, it's got part of the, uh, the ramp riser of some kind of structure that's underneath it. So I think I- And that's also, in the middle of West Street, Bob, right? So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's in the middle of West Street, I and think. And it's right? pretty close to where the actual, uh, the actual sewer lines are. So I, I was thinking that we were owed a discussion of that. Yeah. At least, it, at least it should be in the pictures and people should say, well, it doesn't work because of this or that. And we- But I think that's have, a great idea, Bob. I think that's a great have, idea. Uh, a chance to respond to that. Uh, and so I think, I think I want, that's what I want to say. I think that that's one of the live options for this. I think it does the least harm. It's just north of the bridge and it's kind of a dead, it's a dead area. Uh, so I think, and it wouldn't I think be it blocking, could actually work. No. It wouldn't be blocking particular views. It's, it's in the middle of the street. Which is well, also it's a view of the parking lot on the other side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. On the other side, from and there's this and, garage. And at that point, there's a line of trees and hedges and things that's pretty dense next to the next to the bike lane, and mm -hmm. that actually kind of obscures it pretty well right there too. So if, if you have to have such a thing, and it's it's absolutely as necessary as a sewer line, then we have to have it somewhere, and we just. Well, the best we can do is try and suggest the, the least harmful or impactful places possible. So, so I at least expect that included in the next discussions and rest my case. That's good. No, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, solution, two things. Number one is the, an alternate, a fourth location, because the um, design people hadn't discussed that. And we did talk about this in, in Environmental Com Protection Committee. I remember this now. Thank you, Bob. Uh, an, an alternate location is number one, and number two would be the um, the symmetry. We don't want symmetry with every place else in the city. Those two things on the resolution is so far is what I'm looking at. And then um, Robert Zach, please, Bob, please speak. Unmute him, though, uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, um, I'd like to just follow on what Bob just Bob Schneck just said. Not only is there uh, uh, Space in the center island by West Thames. There's also south of that near the opposite Morris Street. There's a crosswalk there as well. But there is a substantial island space there, and that's I, I don't know if it's large enough to accommodate a structure of this side, but size. But that should be looked at as well. But the, the, I also want to follow on on Vinton Thompson's comments because I agree with him wholeheartedly that having a structure with a wall facing directly on Little West Street directly across from the, the Ritz and from the hotel is really possibly the worst of solutions here if the structure needs to be built. Um, first of all, it would be removing oh, all of the vegetation for that 40 foot as was noted. On the agenda. Bob Zach is 
Pardon? Sorry, I think um, someone is, is talking no, besides. No, so he's, everybody he's who's not called that, mute yourself. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I think it might be Vinton who's, who's not on mute. Yes, I think that was Vinton's uh, uh, lovely voice. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, it having it a wall directly on the street, it also creates a barrier for people trying to get out of the uh, passenger side of their cars so that they don't have to get out in traffic. Uh, for some pedestrians, it, it would be extremely unsightly, um, and it does create um, a, a rather um, futuristic, uh, it, it creates a rather barren look for Little West Street, which is very narrow thoroughfare at that point. And I know the people, uh, uh, the president at the Millennium also feels very strongly um, that that is the worst possible location for that structure as well. Putting it in, whether it goes into this into the walkway and diminishes the size of the walkway, those are things that um, I, I think Nick has said will be addressed and looked at and reviewed. But I did want to point out that uh, um, we completely at the Vision Air condominium. Uh, I'm the president there. We strongly oppose the creation of that structure in the planting area directly on the street and urge an alternate location to be found. So, so I have a question for you, Bob, and, and then for Vinton too. Uh, whether it's in the planter or in the promenade, it's still a wall, right? So you're objecting, to, you're, you're objecting to the whole thing, correct? At that location right there. Uh, yes, I think the first priority should be to find an alternative location away from the promenade. That's, yeah. And yeah, that there I, are workable, workable locations that would require the least uh, destruction of vegetation and aesthetic appeal. Yeah, that that would be a very well said. Uh, therefore, be it resolved. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else on the board have anything to say? Anybody, any place? Bob, is still up, but I'm assuming you're done. All right, so I will move on. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Thank you so much for presenting this. Um, I, I think we did a, a super great job on explaining it. But um, you, you, this well. is feedback for folks is and always and it's been a while. I think since both when you were last at MCNY, um, this is helpful. Uh, and what I would emphasize, actually, it's kind of a piece of what we discussed earlier with Allied and everything else. I, I'd like to emphasize that. We're not alone, and we're in this together. And when I say that, is that um, you know, push forward on this kind of necessary project. I don't think flowers in particular. I mean, resiliency. There's a whole host of folks that we're going to be working with and through, and hopefully in close consultation uh, with. So it's DOT, it's DEP, it's the community board, it's various it's the public design. Uh, commission, et cetera. So this is really helpful. And I, I, I'll take this back to the folks. Uh, I just wanted to confirm what I had heard from you. So of this is your character, my characterization of your characterization of the two. Of the two proposed again, I want to emphasize proposed conceptual locations, both of which are bad. Less bad of the two is the one that's in the walkway and the more bad of the two is the one that's in the planting bit. Is that right? I'm not saying that if you say yes, I'm going to say put it in the walkway. Just I want to understand. Yeah, that's I don't know that that's what he said, but yeah, Bob Zach, un unmute Bob Zach and ask him ask him that question. I'm not sure that's what he said. Vinton and Bob Zach, is that what you were saying, open. Bob right. Zach? Well, if we if we if if we have a choice between strict nine and uh, <laughs> You know, rat poison, and rat poison. I suppose the strychnine, because it moves faster through the body, would pre be preferable. Seriously, you know, none of those locations in in the walkway or adjacent to the walkway are really acceptable. And they will destroy the aesthetics. Um, they will destroy a lot of vegetation in the one case, and they will be a barrier to people uh, walking in in the walkway. Right now, there are benches there. People sit there. At lunch and so forth, it's really a very pleasant spot. There yeah. are, I think, if there are alternative locations outside the walkway, that should be the first priority.
to at least examine those and determine whether they are feasible. If they outside are outside of this feasible, area, totally. So, yeah. so no, no walkway, no promenade, no planter at this space. Look farther north, just a little bit to where Bob Schneck was talking about. That's what I think I'm hearing. Amen. Hearing, right. Yes. It's an alternate suggestion. There's, yes, a, there's an unused um, gatehouse that sits right outside the battery tunnel that has absolutely no usage. Nobody ever sits in there. And there's a, a middle island. So I'm not sure if it could potentially be on the east side of the street or if it could be in the plantered area in the center median that is not on top of the tunnel. That's what we're suggesting. And and what about inside the battery park garage? There's a lot of unused space in there. Could that be some? And it's publicly owned. I'm hearing that it's publicly owned space in the battery garage. Well, I think so the space is just referring to is, is sort of under the garage overhang there. Is I think it's the same owned, area. I could be jumping in. I believe it's owned by the MTA. So that would be well, MTA, publicly owned, sort of. I mean, that's sort of quasi, sort of, quasi publicly owned. Yeah, it's not. It's not a public park, but it's it's owned by a public agency, not a private right. park, not a private uh, yeah. individual. Who will benefit? No, a public authority, not a public agency. Got it. But who will benefit from all of the resiliency, like all the rest of us will? So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's something. It, th these are other alternate locations, which Nick, perhaps these are things that can be brought to the development team as other ideas. Because I have to say, I get that we need to do something, but it is just really bad. The promenade area, whether it's north or south, is is just such an unattractive, unappealing location. Yeah, I, I I hear you certainly. I remember Gwen saying it. If I'm paraphrasing her right back in June with the we were kind of caught by surprise as well when this was a new requirement that was added, um, or I guess kind of divulged us during uh, some of the in, in spring yeah. requirement that, that DP had uh, been contemplating. So again, I, I want to qualify by saying it's still discussions having and taking place, um, but I did want to make sure that at Justine's request, we came back to the committee and just caught up on some of those conversations yeah. uh, in June. So that was my best attempt to some of our conversations that have happened since June. Additional conversations on kind of tech, technical solutions are happening. So we will be back with more, certainly, even before design begins. So there is going to be ample opportunity for public feedback. And just a, a thought, Nick. Um, and well, it's if, if the other possibilities, but if, if, if the suggestion of having it in the garage with the MTA's property, being taken or used is they can say no they're a public agency so is the battery park city authority a public agency so i know this is your like you want to do this but you can also say no we're not going to do it here so so that would be something that maybe i i throw that out to you as a concept and i know we got a lot more talking to do but i throw that out to you if they can say no so can you that's a concept tammy is your hand raised raised oopsie so i call on you no okay no no that's fine all right, if we have nothing further, can we move on to peer A? Yes, I mean, it's fine with me. All right, Justine, do you want me to? Please, if, you, if you're willing, Nick, you want to get started. I mean, we know to start with peer A, you're in charge. Go ahead. So let me just bring something up really quickly. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so you had seen in uh, certain of our esteemed local publications word that uh, PRA had, had ceased operations and Justine had asked me just for a kind of a, a quick update here and um, on the is Open had an impact on growth in industries across the city and country and news to anybody. Um, so, very very hard house is currently closed and BPA is 
all relevant parties to uh, try to determine a path forward. Pierre Plata, as they noted, uh, remains open and accessible to the public. Um, in terms of context, I'll have it. So BPCA leases Pier A from the, the city of New York. And then in turn, it's up to uh, uh, a, an operator. Um, so our relationship with uh, existing operators is that of a tenant relationship. You may call wake of Hurricane, well, I shouldn't say in the wake, even in advance of Hurricane Sandy, Battery Park City Authority has assumed control of uh, Pay with um, for some years. To uh, we spent a good amount of Sandy pushed back those plans, but as a result of the work done pursuant to that, we were. Uh, Fully uh, able to reopen PRA with a host of new resiliency measures, including uh, raising a lot of the electrical equipment and other sort of uh, and above grade into the upper floors, um, putting marine grade lumber in a lot of the places so that it could stand to get wet if it had to be. Fresh sometimes comes up with a resiliency project that will happen here. It's a wall, you put a wall around it. Uh, there is no the idea with PRA is that God forbid you would have a sandy type event or something similar or worse. Forbid. You would have the doors of PRA open and have the water run through it, but uh, have it that proof enough uh, minimal compared to what it sustained, compared to what it has uh, last time. We share, um, we share the same spirit and everyone else is that we want to be open there. Providing community benefit for folks. So, so on that, but it is currently closed. Um, it's currently closed. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for the update. I got a question. Wasn't there something someplace about um, the operators of Pier X owing the authority back rent or something? Is that still existing? Is that anything that's out there that somebody someplace owes back rent? And what's the status of that? It was, you know, the tenant is only. I have to check some of my notes, but there was uh, an agreement reached that our, I think our board had voted on some time ago for the repayment of uh, of some some back rent that would. Uh, so yes, I don't want to speak more on it because I, I I don't have the particulars in front of me. But yes, that was something that there was some back rent, back rent owed, and we had uh, um, ready to uh, arrange for repayment of that. Okay, so I guess what I'd love you to do is for the next meeting, just as part of your report, come back to me and let me know what the deal was. Is it waived? Is it owed? You know, what's the deal now? That's all. And I don't expect you to answer off the cuff now. That's fine. I didn't, it just occurred to me and we didn't talk about it. I'm going to give you okay. time. Yeah, sure. So sorry about that. Anybody have any questions? As Bob has his hand raised. Anybody else? Bob, you're up. Okay, I I just wanted to say that I think that um, it's important to realize that I suppose I'm interested in finding out whether or not the agreement with the current operator can keep going and to what extent can the community board be involved in those uh, conversations to kind of keep it the way it is if we go as we grow back from the COVID, because it's really a good thing. But I think that uh, my impression over the last few years is that the uh, bar part of it's a little bit too big and that um, it never really, it rarely filled itself up except on very special days. So maybe there's some kind of agreement that could repurpose some of that space and the community board could be involved with those agreements. The second thing I think that's important is that it's in um, in terms of the environmental protection part of it. It's the lowest point in the area, and it really needs special protections. And those protections, whatever we do with them, are going to be quite expensive. And so that discussion uh, as part of environmental protection is important. And the final thing I want to comment on 
is there has been a controversy over quite a bit of time about building a new and larger uh, uh, eating venue uh, in Wagner Park. But if Pier A can't be successful, then um, then there's a question about even, you know, <laughs> do we need such a thing? Is it, is, isn't it fine the way it is with the Gigino that's there and just kind of big enough and kind of fits? So I'm in the more conservative uh, Wagner Park uh, group that says, you know, the way it is works pretty well. And to have a huge and amazingly expensive disruption of the whole area might really be unnecessary, especially at a time when uh, money and resources in Battery Park City and in Lower Manhattan are probably going to be more stressed for the next five years than they have in the last 25 years. So uh, we, we it's an opportunity for us as a community board to get involved with that if Justine's interested in in taking all of these issues into some kind of resolution that kind of is a general discussion of that and a general discussion of community preferences then i'm on board with that and i rest my case thank you that's a very interesting concept bob i don't know if nick has an answer for you for any of it but um i think it's an interesting concept and also what about just moving to gino's wait what moving to gino's to that space Try to take each item if the community board has ideas about um, pure and then certainly like anything else, we, we want to hear them. Uh, that, goes, that goes across the board. I mean, I got we're here every month, we want to hear what you have to say, um, certainly. And uh, we do our little hope to, to make sure you all deliver on the things that we can you know, pick up any number of things. but. Going back to the start of the meeting, um, the idea of having uh, special patrol officers was uh, due to Eric's extraordinarily hard work and a number of people at the authority. Uh, we got to the place where we had them, and it was a small part to the people who were asking. Yeah. We think we can do better. Um, you know, we have friends in the park, there's any number of things that we can try to deliver on. There are certain things um, we all have responsibility to do, and, and resiliency, as we've been saying. Um, you know, is number one in terms of protecting the physical plant. And that said, number two, I wish we didn't have to do anything either. We have a lot yeah. of other things, but we not yeah. that, that up. Either we try to whatever part of mother will change it and destroy it for us. Now, thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. And thank you, Bob. I, I like those are interesting ideas, Bob. I, I just, I just want. But just one tiny thing I want to add, and that is I don't want to be misconstrued as abandoning the idea of protection. I'm simply oh, interested yeah. in simplifying protections, not to not to spend if you can if you can get protection at eight million dollars as opposed to thirty six million dollars, I'm in the eight million dollar camp. And I want to yeah. have the economic branch of these of these discussions be as powerful as the here's what we need branch. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I appreciate that. And um, Nick, what I throw back to you too is that it's just as it's good for us to give you you guys ideas. Whatever ideas are ruminating on that on your on your side for what Pure is going to do or can do or can be after the fact, if if in fact it doesn't open up as a restaurant again with with the Hulakopoulos, um, let us know. So let make it be a two way street, and that would be what I would ask. As as you yes, know, yes. I will I will come back. I mean, I have written my. Gray, what is paid, what is owed, as an item to get back to you on, but no, that's fine. Anyway, you know, if it has, I have updates on pure rate, certainly. I appreciate that. And then Kathy has her hand up, so let's go to Kathy. You're muted. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, Nick, do you think there's any chance that the authority would not manage the peer going forward? And, um, I missed a little bit of the conversation, so I was getting a work text, but um, are there other uses being considered aside from just, you know, a, a restaurant um, venue? I remember early on the Italian American Immigration Museum was lobbying to, to transform the pier. I apologize if I'm kind of repeating, Bob's. 
be okay. I think um, I'm not in a position or do I know really more than what I have shared. I wouldn't think though. I, what, what I can say is this is, I think I mentioned this just in early when we kind of the, we talked a little bit. So this thing, this thing it's actually to just, well, there's things now, right? Um, that's still going to have to work through whatever shape the, the puree takes an existing reason to be addressed, right? Uh, payments never exist out there, so we can't say yes or no. We have to say it's that needs to be addressed and all the attendant issues kind of associated with that um, need to be worked through. Um, and then for additional use. And yeah, we're going to hear it, but it's, we're not, we're not, we may not get there because it needs to be worked through. There are legal ramifications. And again, going through the night with things that I am not, not an engineer. A designer, not an attorney, but it's enough to know all the legal considerations that you existing lease. Uh, and that we are endeavoring to look at now um, as we try our best to do the path forward. But we'll keep going. That's really nice, but that's, uh, well, thank that's you. Really awesome. Given kind of the lease that still exists and what we need to be worked through. Anything else? So, anything else, Kathy? Are you good? I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, and so, before I move on, Nick, um, one thing to throw out to you is, um, and we talked about this offline, but just to put it out there as an idea, if in fact the lease does not go forward as a restaurant going in for Pier A, what about moving the um, staging area, the security area, whatever else, all those horrible white ugly tents that are in Battery Park now for the, stat for the um, Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island Ferry, and moving that whole operation into PRA. I know you don't have an answer for me now, but as a concept, other other ideas. I mean, a museum, great, but trying to get that out of Battery Park is an eyesore, and it also blocks off public access access all over the place. I don't know what the um, impact would be with the crowds around PRA going in and out, but there's a building upstairs could be put to use. I mean, there's a lot of concepts there that could be useful, but I throw that out as an idea. Um, and, you know, I know there's no answer because all you could say is, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, anybody else have anything to say on this issue? I think not. So let's move well, on. Again, just, oh, Bob, I just want to make one. I, I hate to have so many ideas, but. That's all um, right. But you should be in my profession. <laughs> I'm also on <laughs> small, small business ah, committee. And, okay. and the interest is how should an interesting and powerful question is how should leaseholders and, uh, and landlords behave? And the Battery Park City Authority is the is the landlord, and it gets a chance to manage in public above board the current person that holds the lease and the current organizations that hold the lease, and it can actually set be a model of what's fair. What's fair? How do we? kind of protect the interests of small business owners? How do we protect the interests of those people that have, that have had jobs there? How do we protect the interest of the community, which is accustomed to having those wonderful, for example, holiday venues that we've used a bunch of times for Battery Park City. Um, and so it's a really wonderful place. It needs to have some repurposing, but I think that the current leaseholder uh did very well in their ownership of it for a while and hopefully we're not going to go back to anything like covid so it's a matter of how do landlords work with uh the people that rent from them in with in terms of commercial leases what are ideal conditions that we can kind of model here that helps everybody out and comes to the best conclusion i rest my Okay, thank you for sharing, Bob. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that's it. Somebody just better. 
speak up if they want to say something. I think we're good. So let's move on. Um, excuse me. I want to jump to do Nick's report, and I think we might skip skip Patrick's report because we kind of focused a lot on Patrick today. So I think I think I think he's good and off the hook. But before you start, Nick, I want to ask you a question. So I got an email from someone who I think is still in the attendee list. Oh, has not raised their hand. But go ahead. No, no, no. This is a, it's, it's a value report, basically. It, it, it's following up with a message that was sent about construction or incomplete construction opposite 300 Rector Place in Rector Park. Oh, oh. the curve of replacement project. I guess that's what it is. If it's you were to tell me when I was a little kid <laughs> and I wanted to grow up and be like an astronaut or a firefighter or a baseball player, and you instead told me, no, you're going to be talking about the curb valve replacement project. I would say that's an interesting life. Yeah. So, yes, the long it's and the this- short of it is there is, uh, yeah, it's right along Rector Park. Eric, if he's still on, can attest to this has kind of been the bane of our existence for a while. Preach. So there is, right, it's a curb valve needed to be replaced. It's, 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 uh, I don't even, I, there's a what does even a curb with, valve mean? It's, it's like it's, a it's, fire hydrant. I don't know if it's a fire. It's it it. Eric, maybe you can help me out here. It, it, long and the short of it is, we're we're talking with DEP, and there may or may not need to be a water shut off to actually finish the work there. The work is done, but we actually just need to close up the actual construction. But there may there may or may not need to be a work turn water turn off order. And if that's the case, we want to make sure we coordinate with the building so we're not turning the water off in the middle of the day when people actually. Now everyone is also home because it's a yeah. pandemic. So, yes, this is one that is really annoying, uh, and it's it's us, but it's not entirely us. There are some contingencies that we have to continue to push on, to get clearance to do. But um, I actually was not in the meeting today that Eric perhaps wasn't, so maybe he can update us on any updates. Sorry to put you on the spot there, buddy. No. I- I, I don't believe it came up in today's meeting, but I, you know, proper irrigation of Rector Park is a nagging priority for the team. And to, to Nick's point, um, getting that work done um, isn't just an aesthetic issue with regards to wrapping up the construction, but it's also um, needed for us to make sure that we're able to attend to the park properly. So we've been working really hard to that end, but it's certainly not a, a low priority item for us. That's for sure. Was this was this anything that was put on hold because of the whole COVID no construction? And is that part of the delay? Um, you know, it's I'm, I don't because I honestly have to tell you with COVID and with with all the craziness, I'm I don't pay attention and I walk around, but I'm not always wear, aware. So I guess I would just say, notes, but yeah, I would say sort of across the board. Sorry, I'm off video. No. Um, yeah. Say so it's sort of across the board. Um, there was a you know a construction pause as a result of COVID. So I don't want to say that this wasn't covered by it. Did you? But I would say um, that, put your sheets in the laundry. Um, Tammy, yeah. I don't think you're asking us about your sheets. I was like, did I leave my laundry out? Yeah, I know, right? That's outstanding. <laughs> was a mistake. Sorry, <laughs> that was us. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that dream that you wake up and you feel like you're late for school, even though you're a grown adult and there is no school. It's oh, like, there yeah. are no, there's, it's like, hey, what did I do now? Shoes. Yes. Go ahead. I'm um, so I was just saying that and laundry day. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that this work was paused as a result of COVID, but not exclusively as a result of, of, of COVID. We're trying to work through the both interagency elements and also some of the construction peccadilloes that are involved. Right. We are nonetheless, we, we are acutely aware of this and are very, very eager to get it solved okay. and fixed and patched up. So thank you. And I hope I don't want to say I promise because I can't, but I certainly by the time I'm next to you. It's either done or I have a, an idea about when it will be done. That would be great if you could. It's gone, on, that, it's gone on too long. Certainly. The, the person who sent it to me said that it's been incomplete for a year and I, I I believe her. <laughs> I just have no knowledge personally. So I'm just we're delaying the information and I, I don't know. So that's what the that's what the email says. So I just would ask. I mean in a year, if it's been a year, it's been a year of almost no, COVID. So it's got it's got it's got it's, it's, it's gotta it's gotta get done. So yes, uh, 
It does. So just message keep delivered and we will, uh, thank you. we'll get it. Thank you. And, and thank you for the resident who brought that to my attention so I could bring it up. Go ahead with your report. Nick. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more thing I want to say about the, um, oh gosh, the leaf blowers. Thank you. Yes. There yes. were no leaf blowers this morning. I am so pleased. I don't know if it was because of weather or whatever else, but I slept late. I got on to work late because the leaf blowers are my alarm. Would you see? <laughs> so I am I am very happy that they're not blowing early in the morning. I thank okay. you for that. Well, good. I, I wish I, I could say that I had something to do with oh. it, but I will continue to relay the fact that as best we can, we want to try and be as responsive as we can to the community while also kind of maintaining our parks to the standard. But um, yes, I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll uh, we'll keep on trying to do the best we can with uh, balancing those competing interests. But thank, but you. thank you for that. No, no, thank you. Go ahead. All right, Lucian. All right. I'm firing it up. Yeah. Uh, I'm firing it up. Ten minutes, no less, because we're going to hang up because I have to feed the puppies who are crying. No, it's going to be great. I really, I really, you know, I want these things to be really good for you guys when I put them together. Before so. I start this up, the, there's one member of the public who has one thing to add. So you can't stop the meeting until um, Andres uh, Bolivar has a chance to, um, to you know, speak. So let me fire this okay. up. All right. <clears throat> All right. Sorry, is it is it is it on? Is it yeah, on? I'm pulling. I'm pulling it up. I'm pulling it up. Okay. I'm, I'm just I'm waiting for it to pop up on my screen. Everyone's gonna get a kick out of this. No, no, no it's okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lucian. So, you will see that that is uh, obviously, as we know, the Grinch. It is um, kind of a little bit of a a little bit of levity to what is a very difficult time. As we know, COVID has been leading off my reports every month to this committee since I believe it, I believe it was April. Um, but, you know, it's obviously very important for us to uh, stay vigilant as we are entering now what seems to be a second wave. So please remember, as we always have, to wear your masks and uh, keep a safe distance. As Pat had noted earlier in his report, and I thank him for that, um, the ambassadors have been stationed in providing masks to anyone who needs them and will accept them uh, at our parks on their shifts. And I think over the course of Thanksgiving uh, weekend or thereabouts, about uh, five, five dozen or so masks were actually given out to folks. Uh, they offer them to a lot more, but I know that we are continuing to do our best to make sure that folks are aware of the need to wear masks, obviously, and to actually wear them if they don't have. So as I've always done, Lucian, you can scroll down. Thank you. I just put the kind of coronavirus most recent updates on uh, the chart here, uh, latest information on restrictions, um, whether an address falls into any one of the red, orange, or yellow zones, um, et cetera. Um, and there's information there about uh, getting tests, forward NY restrictions, uh, filing complaints about businesses or employers who are uh, kind of flouting the rules. So thank you for that. And obviously, as I always do at the very bottom, you can click here, it's hyperlinked for daily coronavirus emails directly to your inbox. What I've also added now here is number two on page two, Roman numeral two. Um, we've been uh, closely monitoring for the duration, but uh, we put it now in short form for the committee. The percent positivity rates in Battery Park City, we have been, again, amongst the luckier neighborhoods in, in, in New York City to have uh, not seen a huge spike, but we did see a, a slight bit of an uptick um, and looks like the week leading up to Thanksgiving. What I've done on this chart here is provide the percent positives on a seven day rolling average uh, from the 17th to the 23rd and then all the way up to the 22nd through the 28th. Um, each of Battery Park City's two zip codes uh, I set against the citywide, uh, the citywide average. So we are well below the citywide average. Uh, and trending steadily downward, importantly, in both zip codes, including 102A2, which for a bit there was up uh, up around 3%, if not a little more. So uh, that information is available on the New York City Health Department's website. You can click on the map that I've linked, and you can track those positivity rates um, on a daily basis. I think the uh, that data is updated, I think, after midnight every day. Um, 
For those of you who apply or to subscribe to Notify NYC, which I recommend you all do, that's the city's emergency notification um, system, uh, you will uh, be aware that there is now, again, an acute need for blood in New York City. So the first thing I wanted to add is if you are really keen on donating and can do so, I would encourage you to do so. There's actually a blood drive, thanks to our friends at the New York Blood Center, tomorrow, that's Thursday the 3rd, in the financial district. So at Stout, which is at 90 John Street, the bar is not open right now, but they are using the space for a blood drive. So we thank our partners there and at the New York Blood Center for hosting that. And then that rolls directly into our next Battery Park City blood drive, which is Wednesday, January 20th. I know a lot of our our local uh, papers have done a great job promoting and helping us get the word out about that. And the community has been doing a magnificent job. So thank you to all who have donated and continue to update over the course uh, to donate over the course of five blood drives since June. And I've listed them there out at the bottom. We've gotten more than 400 donations, uh, including uh, 70, another 77 units collected just last month, November 17th, we did one and it was another very successful session. So thank you everyone and, uh, and keep it coming. New Yorker need, New Yorkers need you. Okay, um, the top of page three, very briefly, it's that time of year again. So as we know, Holiday Lights usually happens in person at South Cove. Instead, this year it is virtual, but we filmed it in South Cove, and it will be going live tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So click on uh, the YouTube channel, and you will be able to see a special arrival by our friend Santa Claus uh, singing and uh, overall merriment by our partners at PS276 and by the Sing Harlem Choir. There's Nick, also you ruined a de- the surprise. Well, you no, re- I'm, you know, it's in there. It's in the report. I'm not assuming anything. Um, but what I really would like to draw your attention to is the top two items right underneath that graphic, Lucian. Um, we are, as we usually do, partnering with some great community organizations for folks who may want to donate, uh, not blood this time, but other needs, other goods to folks in need. So if you'd like to make a donation to City Harvest, you can click there to do it. And uh, or to stockings with care, there are ways to help. The city yeah. harvest, especially, oh, okay. is is very very helpful. I mean, they make it incredibly user friendly. It's not just you put an amount in; you get to choose what you want to donate, whether it's a box of fruit or veg, pasta or sauce, or any number of things. It really is a very user friendly uh, interface. And I would hope that uh, if you can spare a little bit, you can do so to try and help your neighbors in need. So thank you for that. A lot. Of- around the Hollands, and you will see these ads in our, in our local papers as well as we try to get the word out. Um, top of page four, this is actually an interesting item, and, you know, the community board has always been a very good partner and sounding board on any number of issues around the neighborhood, and one of the things I wanted to broach with you briefly is you will recall that in late March this year, we opened up our, our lawns a little early. We usually do it in mid-April, but we opened them early this year because we wanted to promote social distancing and give some folks additional space outside to be outside without being too close to one another. Uh, and while they usually get fenced off for the season around the mid-November time frame, we have, in fact, extended that out to about mid-December now. So um, starting probably the week of the 14th or so, you'll see the familiar fencing going up around the lawns throughout Battery Park City with an important caveat. And that is in an interest, in the interest of trying to kind of, again, promote social distancing and provide additional for, for space for people who we know need it. And we've gotten some feedback that folks really appreciate it. We are exploring the idea of, of kind of leaving certain parts of the lawns for certain parts of the season open through little you know, small gates in the fencing so that we can leave uh, public access to certain of the parks open uh, throughout the winter season. Um, so folks would have an additional additional time to uh, to be out there and enjoy the, the, the fresh air without being too close uh, to one another. Now, certain qualifiers apply, right? When if, it, if it's a rainstorm or something like that, you're gonna close the fields off because they just get wrecked. Um, and this doesn't include the fields that are generally open anyhow. So the ball fields will be open all winter. West Ham's lawn is open. Uh, we sometimes, we will usually open Teardrop Park and the little slope there on days when it snows so folks can, uh, kids can sled on it. But we're talking about, you know, some of the larger areas of Wagner Park and Rockefeller Park on a rotating basis. We would like to experiment this year and try to keep them open um, for the community benefit and to have folks enjoy their beautiful parks and public spaces. I guess my question for the community board is, does this sound good to you? And if so, would you mind perhaps then in the spring 
There's a chance that the, 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 the lawns will, of course, be beautiful because our horticulturists do a great job, but there's a chance they may not look exactly the same because we're trying to keep them open for more people to use. Um, so I wanted to broach that with you and let you know, let, and uh, hear what you thought about it. I will let everybody else get a chance to speak if you want to, but I think that's a great idea. I think more open space is necessary and better. And um, yeah, I think the gates are a great idea. Um, it's just wonderful. So yeah, great idea. And if you can do it longer, that's wonderful. But if you can't, I understand that too. Um, okay. so yeah, I've thumbs up from me, but I also could, could we interrupt you now and um, I see people with hands raised. Is a good yes. time? Yes, of course. Do you need a resolution from us to support that? Um, no. Okay. Happy, yeah, but happy to have it, but no, it's something that we, uh, you know, our, our parks folks really do a great job. They actually they had this idea, um, and I wanted to make sure that you know I I, I broached it with you, but uh, I think it's something that we would like to we would like we would yeah. like to do. So ideally, I guess the the form and shape this would take is what I'd want to do is come back to you guys. Well. In, by the time I come back to you in January, it may hopefully be able, actually open up a few weeks already, but I'd like to at least publish a calendar or some type of, probably in a number of different ways, right? Like a calendar or social media or a blog post or something that goes out yeah. to the community that basically says, hey, for this two week stretch, the North Lawn of Rockefeller Park is gonna be open. That's and then perfect. for this, uh, the South Lawn of, of Wagner. And then for the succeeding two week stretch, it'll be the South Lawn of Rockefeller and the, and the, the Central Lawn at Wagner. So you give some of the areas some room to heal but you still have a consistent kind of um, bevy of lawn space that's available to folks. So, no, we, we, we would like to do it uh, if you don't have any objection. It's not like we need you to push us on it, not that we would okay, mind. Okay, cool. No, we want to do it unless you tell us this is the worst thing you've ever heard. No, no, I think it's a great idea myself. But, um, okay. so, yes, I say yes to that. If, if you are willing to take a pause and let's let Jill go and then Andrew Zelter go and then let's – and then – Yes, of course. Yeah, Andres, I'm assuming, well, he's got to go too. So we'll, and I'm going to interrupt you for that. And then, so go ahead, uh, Jill first, and then um, Andrew. Two part quick question, uh, I'll read the COVID numbers. Why are the numbers so much higher in the northern part of Battery Park? Almost double, it seems. And the second uh, question is, in, in your role as a state related agency, do you have any uh, role in the the uh, vaccine distribution or selecting areas or anything like that. Um, it's a good set of questions. I will try to tackle the first, uh, Eric, on the end. Although I'm pretty sure the answer is no. We would do that through uh, through and with the city and state health authorities. But um, in the north, you know, it's a good question. I remember seeing something on that. I I don't I don't I don't know why, but I know that. You know, if you look at the map, when you get a chance, I've linked it there. What's interesting is the data that they provide is not just the positivity rate, but the total number of tests. And the reason I say that is the denominator, I think, in Battery Park City is a lot smaller than it is elsewhere. So, for instance, you'll mouse over a zip code someplace else in the city and it'll say, for the seven-day period, there were 2,500 tests, right? And then the positivity rate is X. In Battery Park City, not always, but often, the total number of tests is like, 300, which is not nothing, but you can appreciate if you have 300 tests and eight people test positive, that's going to be a, 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 a not insignificant percentage. I want to say one of those, it's 15 now and a few weeks will be down to nothing. I'm not saying that, but I am saying contextually, I think you would have in Battery Park City, you run, you run the chance of having a higher percentage rate, even with not that many tests because you're dealing with the a relatively low number of tests overall. Yeah, but the question is the comparative reason. I mean, between yeah. South and yeah. North, that, that's yeah. the question. I don't know. I I I I don't know. I don't know. Because you don't have question. a denominator in that between South and North. You just have it for Battery Park City as a whole versus other places, right? No, no. He had South and North. No, no. The two zip codes. Well, I saw that. Yeah. I guess I'd go back down. You said you know three hundred people in the South versus a thousand people in the North. That's not what you were saying. Right. So for instance, I'll bring I'll bring it up now because I have it I have it open on my desktop all the time. So for instance, if you'll in, indulge me for the map yesterday, it was it's the most recent number, right? So for zip code one oh two eight two for the dates November twenty second to November twenty eighth, there were two hundred and four two hundred and four people tested in that time frame. In this 
10.0280, there were 301 people tested in the same time frame. If you mouse right across to, let's say, zip code 10012, there were 1,200, almost 1,300 tests, right? There are areas where there's over 2,000 tests. It's just... Okay, that, a, that's what you're... Yeah. Right. And so even with, even with that sentence, there's less tests in the north, so... That answers kind of, I mean, if that's true, less tests in the north, even if it's two people, it'll be more impactful. Yeah, like I, th I think I saw something where the days when it was a little higher, it was uh, 11 total positive tests. Um, hmm. Which, yeah. again, that's, that's, not not lot, in, but... that's, not, that's not in any way to downplay it, but, you know, you see, oh, my God, it's 3.5%. That must be, you know, 100 people. It's, it was 11 people. And who knows, that could have been... That could have been one group of folks. I don't know. It could have been. I don't. I don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah, no, so go, and don't get me but, wrong. I'm yeah, discounting what you're saying. I, what I, was that's important to us, is, I think, sure. from a, from an operational perspective, and making sure that we're keeping a very close eye on this, is that the numbers, very thankfully, continue to trend downward, mm -hmm. um, even in the area where it is, even in the north where it is actually starting a little bit of a higher point. Um, Eric, did I butcher that too much, or is that about right? If you're still on. Yeah, I don't have evidence or information to the contrary. When I say right. that, I don't know that I don't know that that is the cause, but I also, um, you know, it it sounds like a plausible reason for why the numbers would be would be different. Um, and then the second question about the role of the state in vaccine distribution, I we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have a role in that, except my guess is maybe facilitating whatever we can access to the right uh, organizations, maybe to help spread the word. Do I have that right? Yeah, what I would say is that, you know, we're in close communication with the governor's office and also with, you know, state health officials and to the extent necessary, the health and hospitals folks at the city. And, you know, that we've told them time again that we're here to support in every possible way. And, you know, we've named the various resources, whether it's space or staff, et cetera, that we can leverage to be of, of support, particularly when it comes to supporting the Battery Park City community. Um, the, um, and the other thing I would just say is I, they will call upon us. You know, <laughs> I don't think they, even without the offers, they're eager to enlist the, the help of as many hands as possible. But I would expect, and I'm now um, maybe speaking out of turn here, but I would expect that much of the testing will mirror your sort of standard um, flu shot experience more than it would be, you know, tents in the ball fields or something like that. So I'm expecting more of the more of the testing to take place in in pharmacies and primary care facilities and, and right. hospitals. So, so Eric, you're saying testing. Do you mean vaccines? I did. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, I that's okay. No, no. Thanks. Just making sure because that was yeah. my question too. Is is can you get testing down here? But I'm thinking maybe they're doing testing at Rite Aid. Are they? I don't know. There's a, there's a facility that's open to the public, but it's um, but it's by appointment in the in the Brookfield com yes. complex called Carbon Health, um, and so tests are available there. They take insurance, and then um, there's you know the, the city MD on Chambers yes. and some other local spots. And I would encourage spots. everyone to to visit the the website that the state put together yes. for find a testing site near me. Okay. Um, and it's it's really, really helpful. If you just Google like NYS, find a COVID testing site, it's the first one that comes up. Um, and also, I'll just put in a, a brief plug for the city's um, rapid testing, which I just want to make a distinction is different than the, than the antigen test that they run, but it's the regular PCR test. Um, yeah. But they just provide the results very quickly, like within a, an hour or two. Yeah, 20 minutes. Governor. But it's, it's taking them two days, and, and the wait online was how long this morning, Ollie? Two and a half hours. Two and a half hours, and she went when they opened. Because I saw I saw friends on Thanksgiving. I need to stay safe, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, that's cool because we've been doing it too. But yeah, I've had people wait five hours, and we didn't do that. But yeah, but that was today. So that's your latest update. Thank you very yeah, thank much. You. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, Betty, don't be, don't be silly. What? Go ahead. Go ahead, Betty. Unmute. Yes, thanks. Go. Yes. Uh, I want to speak to the lawns in general and being open. Theoretically, I'm very much for that because I agree with what you said about people needing space and opportunities. 
Mm -hmm. I want to kind of give the flip side, and that is some users are very aggressive users of this space. But there's a spot outside of, of my place that I can look at. And in fact, it's a martial arts group that goes out and works in Rockefeller Park, right by where the kids' playground is. It's in front of that area. Mm -hmm. And it's just mud. I mean, it's nothing but mud. So when people come, families and others to sit, they're now relegated over to the side where there's a little bit of grass or something to cushion under their blanket. Uh, so some users actually make it useless for anybody but themselves. And it's going to be very difficult bringing that grass back. You're just going to be starting from just mud. So I don't know how to balance it, but with some of the users, it's not really being open. It's only for their benefit. It's not for anybody else's benefit. Mm. Okay, that's actually really helpful, Betty. I think that uh, Eric and I will certainly take that back. I think this is probably that the, there's likely a role here for uh, the ambassadors to play or to continue to play. It would be my hope that with uh, presumably a smaller area, at least generally over the course of the winter to kind of be open to folks because otherwise areas would be fenced off, might be a little more manageable, but you're right, you have to balance that by saying maybe there's a, there's a portion of the parks open, you have to make sure that's not just dominated by, you know, a group that is just going to want to do their own thing. I think like anything else, there's, there's a balancing act. And again, we want to make sure folks are being responsible when they're outside while also giving, giving the space over to the public to whom it belongs to the extent that we can do that in a, in a safe well, place. This, so, this is probably one business. Notice. Yeah. Well, if it's a business, I'll tell you what, if it's a, if it's a business it looks like and they're it's a, running, it's a class, a martial arts class. If, if it's a business and they're running classes in the park, um, and it's over twenty people, I don't think they should be doing that without a permit anyway. So that should be something we should address. If you want to send me offline some of the particulars, times, and places, we can make sure we can address that through the appropriate channels. Sure, I'll look for that. Yeah, because they have to. They they need to be permitted if they're doing events in our parks, and as it is. Thanks, Betty. Yes, thank you, Betty. All right. Um, maybe He's the guy who was waiting for like yeah, three hours, the poor exactly. guy. Can we talk to Andres now? Andres. Yes, of course. Andres, awesome. come here. First Thank off, you for your guys, patience. No, not at all. I feel like I've gotten to know every single one of y'all. It's been a pleasure taking part in this. I just want to make sure. Yes, perfect. Um, so one, thank you so much for taking, for giving me the time. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time. I also have to walk my dog, Justine. Um, but essentially, I'm a graduate student at the CUNY School of Public Health. Um, oh, great. I just, oh. Yeah, uh, great classes in school. Uh, I mainly wanted to just talk about a legislation that was introduced last year um, and just hoping to garner some support for it. It's legislation 1766, which is essentially would push for a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York and establishing a Green Monday program. For the provision of plant based food by city agencies and participating food service establishments. Um, a version of this initiative, uh, I'm sorry, initiative was actually already introduced by a borough president, Eric Adams, for uh, NYC schools in Brooklyn. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but now all New York City schools, at least when they were open, are serving our children uh, essentially plant based food and plant based alternatives. Um, every Monday and essentially taking that opportunity to educate them about nutrition and sort of alternatives to, you know, having meat and other proteins that they could partake in. Um, this has mainly been a concern of mine because currently food production is one of the leading sources of greenhouse emissions. It generates about 30% of the total global emissions. And last year alone, the United States produced over 103 million pounds of red meat and poultry. Not only that, Americans are essentially eating what is equivalent to 140% of what should be recommended for meat intake. Um, you know, this reliance, I mean, me personally, I used to be this person also. I had meat almost every single day, but it became a concern because it's, it's a dietary imbalance that will, you know, just fill you with cholesterol, saturated fats, sodium. All these factors that in heart related issues that my family happens to suffer from genetically as well. Um, by simply eating less meat or taking out the meat component of it and replacing it with something that might be plant based, 
One could significantly reduce the risk of heart diseases, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes, and even cancer. Um, essentially, what we want to do with this legislation is not is just not only to promote less meat consumption, but really to force consumers to just consider what it is they're taking in every day and maybe consider the alternative. I know that a lot of people haven't necessarily had plant-based alternatives, and by plant-based alternatives, what I'm talking about is like, um, you know, things that are made of bean, pea, soy, plant, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, all of these, you know, I, I feel that with the introduction of these alternatives, it could affect behaviors and possibly future decisions when choosing a protein. I know myself, once I had a Beyond Burger, I'm like, this is close enough. This is amazing. I, why not have this and save a cow, right? There you um, go. Yeah. With the right amount of participation, education, and incentive, I'm hoping that Green Monday might be, might have the potential to not only, you know, affect the skewed diets of New Yorkers, maybe just have them consider not having that bacon, egg, and cheese every morning, which I might suffer from, you know, day to day. But um, what we're essentially hoping for is to contribute towards a movement that seeks to shift away the heavy reliance of the meat industry and, you know, just save the environment a little bit and as well as ourselves. Um, and, yeah, I just wanted to speak about that. But thank you so much for giving me the time. I feel honored. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. And I'm going to suggest that you um, make a appearance at our full board meeting um at the end of the month i don't know the date but you can Nushin can tell you and oh, sure. yeah and and at the beginning of it at six o'clock so you get two minutes to speak and you got to talk to more people than just the 20 of us so that's oh, a good idea. i love the 20 of y'all please yeah. thank you so much <laughs> thank, you so you much. thank you i'll see you at the next <laughs> meeting actually i look yeah. forward to it excellent thank you all right great Thanks. um nick finish it up you've got two minutes please finish it's, gonna be, it's all good stuff all right, look at this. Quickly. Just look at this. Look at this face. This is what I you're know. torturing. Oh, sorry. Go All ahead. right. So, going back to uh, that page right underneath the parks lawns discussion and all the feedback there, um, I put a quick item there for open community meetings. Now, these are the ones you've come to know and love, right? These are our town hall style. Andrew, I fuck you. I'm going to go to meetings. you next, but after next, sorry. Um, now, over the course of the past year, we've done dozens of kind of meetings, uh, mostly targeted on like resiliency and sustainability and board meetings and community board meetings. Um, but what we'd like to maybe do in the start of 2021 to start the year off is to do one of our kind of patented town hall style freewheeling type sessions. So um, the idea is to try to do that. That should be TBD, not TBS, sorry, in early 2021, unless there's a real desire to try and do one late December, but I think that might be difficult with the holidays. So if it's all the same to you, we will work with uh, Lucian and the team here to try and find an open night on the calendar so as not to work at cross purposes, or at least a night that doesn't kind of have a whole lot of overlap with uh, community board uh, items on it to hold that. So more to come on that, um, but hopefully we'll have that date set soon. And uh, I know there's a lot of items people want to catch um, up on generally, right? So not just resiliency, sustainability, although that's welcome, but um, budget, I know we want to do an update on that and talk about some items there. So just to marinate on for now, more to come on, on date and time and Lucian and Tammy and Justine, I'll be in touch with you as we're, we're kind of kicking around some dates. So we can fast forward there. A lot of the stuff we know is important, but it's, it's appeared before sustainability plan is obviously still a top resilient uh, item resiliency. We covered a little bit as well this evening. So I'll skip through that. Perfect. I will go now to the top of page. Um, nine, if you don't mind there, Lucian, I just want to actually, I'm sorry, the bottom of page eight, I just want to make sure that we uh, appropriate props here only because Justine brought it up. Um, this is just a, a nice little tribute to our folks who work uh, our parks operation. So there's a whole bunch of pictures of leaves there at the bottom of page eight, Lucian. Um, and that's just some pictures from our team doing some work, uh, Lucian, it's page eight. The <laughs> um, some great work. Oh, doing, uh, find myself. Let's pay, oh, oh, it's, it's okay. AJ. Next one. Next it's one. Okay. No, next one. Keep going. Oh, uh, I see. I'm, I'm going by the Roman numerals. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Page eight, the top right. Um, oh, okay. That's just uh, some great work by our parks operations folks. There, to my dad joke at the bottom too. There, it says leave it. 
to parks, ops, get it, leave it. <laughs> so that's some great work that they were doing in the southern part of the neighborhood. No leaf blower, Justine. Okay. Those I'm loving the rakes. And I am shuffles and buckets. Yes. Um, but just, you know, just a small token of appreciation to our parks operations staff that do such a great job keeping Battery Park City the best neighborhood in New York City. So I um, want to give them a credit and some shout out for the great work that they do to always keep this neighborhood as pristine as we all expect it to be. Moving down very briefly, as you know, downtown soccer league said farewell. This is the top of page nine allusion to uh, Manny Dalmeda, who was a longtime coach and mentor at the Battery Park City ball field. It was a very nice moment on uh, November 21st. But what I also wanted to draw attention to at the bottom is uh, some really nice testimonials. Again, these were unsolicited. These just came to us. These were people riding the Battery Park City Authority, thanking us for the work and keeping the Battery Park City ball fields open in the fall season. The last one, I think, is my favorite one. I have two children, 11 years and nine years. They've been so excited during the week and on weekends to play soccer on the fields. Everyone in the community that we know have been much healthier as a result of the outdoor activities. Thanks so much for the beautiful fields. So, I mean, it's not me. This is the work that... Freddie and the team do, Parks Operations team, Eric, uh, and the Allied Universal Ambassadors who make sure those fields are well managed and that the folks who have permits can use those fields uninterrupted. And when there are open play hours, they're keeping an eye on things as well. So um, certainly we are far from perfect, but we are, I would think, very far above the average um, for any neighborhood in New York City. Um, I'd also note that also permitted on the fields this fall you wouldn't know there was a pandemic going on, except for all the folks following all the rules and wearing masks. There you we go. had Manhattan Youth, Downtown Giants, PS89, Super Sox Stars, and Asphalt Green all using the fields in a permitted and orderly fashion. So thanks to everyone who helped make that happen. Um, that's it. Next board meeting on the 16th and the next community council meeting for NYPD on December 17th. That was the highlight there that I had had to edit earlier. Sorry, sorry again, Eric. Um, and with that, unless there are any questions, that's all I have. Andrew, I didn't let him speak before. Andrew, go ahead. Very, very quickly. Uh, just first on the the question of keeping the grass uh, areas yes. open longer into the season. Again, theoretically, I think it makes sense. The only thing I would offer is that, Nick, if there's if it increases the risk that you'd have to delay opening those grass fields or grass lawns. <laughs> In the spring, when the weather's warmer and you'd have more people wanting to be out there, I think you might have buyer's remorse if if you kept them open for two or three or four weeks in the winter and had to delay on the back end of that come opening in the spring. So just a thought there. No, understood. Um, I think the idea is to make sure that we stay on the schedule. But uh, all the same, I will take it back and make sure we, we want to do this with uh, minimal to no impact on the back end. This would be in addition to, not instead of. That's That's the vision. Yep, yeah, and then uh, with respect to the work and all the effort as it relates to those ball fields, I think it's as close to perfect as you can possibly get. They're the best facilities in the city, bar none, so kudos to everyone involved with that. And then finally, can you give just a 30-second update on what's going on with the upper terrace and when you think it might be open? I'm going to have to defer to my lifeline here. I'm sorry. I would, but I probably won't be able to say it or find it as quickly as Eric would know, I think. And if, if we don't have it tonight, I can follow up separately. Yeah. Uh, Eric, are you there? He's there. He unmuted. Now he's muted. Oh, he now yeah, I, I am. I am here. I, I just want to, I would want to check with Anthony to confirm before we got back to you, Andrew. That would be great, uh, though, to get back to us. I didn't even, I'm so pathetic. I didn't even know if they were closed. No, no, no. It's totally okay. So, Andrew, actually, thank you for that. We'll follow up with you and uh, Justine will loop you as well. So, you have uh, you have an update. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait till January. We'll get you an update, you know, this week on where we are. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah, that, that's fine. As you can imagine, it just impacts our potential planning for the spring if we are able to have a season and where we locate spectators. Yep. For sure. Andrew, had you had you spoken with with Freddie about this topic? I know that he's been, uh, you know, staying in close contact with Anthony with regards to the status of the project, which, by the way, I know is is uh, is moving along quite well. Yeah. So, great point. We have had frequent contact with Freddie, although I don't know it's as current as it should be. And for some reason, I got the impression that 
the timetable might have accelerated a bit. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but um, as of tonight, I'm, I'm not sure I know what the, the most current status is. But we've had a lot of okay. conversations with Freddie and team, and they've been great. I just don't think we've checked in in the last two months or so. Okay. Yeah, I have a, a meeting with Freddie tomorrow, so I'll, I'll make sure to raise it with him and make sure that he closes the loop with you if, if Nick or I don't get to you first. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you all for putting up with the really long meeting tonight. Um, but I think we got a lot done, and I'm hoping that the community feels heard, and I'm hoping that the authority understands that um, it's okay to get constructive feedback. And we love you guys. You guys are doing a great job and um, nothing changes about that. Um, Allied Universal too. You guys are doing a good job. Let's just keep the lines of communication open because I think that's important. And you have been doing it. So all Please, good. Thank you. And, and thanks everyone, thank thanks you. everyone for the feedback. It's uh, the one that, the, you don't have to hear it, but you need to hear it to make sure you're doing the best job you can for the people you serve. So thank you. And uh, we are listening and we're happy to engage always. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Patrick, thank you. Sorry we made you talk too much at the beginning and not at the end, but that's okay. I think we can all be very happy to turn this off and, and go walk our dogs, feed our puppies, eat our dinner. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Yep. Yeah, everybody Good stay night. safe. Thank Good you all. Bye-bye.